G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give a big shout out to Canva for sponsoring this episode. So making content is an essential part of what I do to keep this show going, but it definitely hasn't always been a seamless creative process. Creating graphics for my YouTube channel to fixing issues with my thumbnails, I certainly have seen my fair share of technology inducing frustrations. I'm definitely not a pro or anything too when it comes to design, so spending hours looking up tutorials is seriously time consuming sometimes. But ever since I found Canva Pro, I can design anything like a pro on any device. Canva Pro is a design platform that empowers you to create and share stunning content in just a few clicks. Whether you're a design professional or just getting started, designing with Canva Pro is amazingly fast and fun. Choose from thousands of professionally made templates that are easy to customize with simple drag and drop features, or start from scratch. Canva Pro comes with endless premium fonts, photos, videos, and so much more that add personality and edge to whatever you're designing. They seriously have an impressive variety of graphics to choose from and virtually endless options. And all this and more in one subscription means never having to pay for another image ever again. Sharing, creating, and organizing designs as a group has never been easier. Canva Pro helps you stay on top of team projects all in one place, which means no more misplaced files or tedious back and forth. With Canva Pro's content planner, you'll save time planning, creating, and posting social media content too. Pause schedule posts and edit them at any time. My favorite Canva Pro feature is actually the resizing feature too. Most of the time doing the sizing is super frustrating and really time consuming because you have to convert inches into pixel measurements or centimeters into inches, do all the math and then ensure everything fits just right, which often it doesn't. But with Canva Pro, they have this great feature that just instantly resizes things for you so you can get back to focusing on improving your project. So design like a pro with Canva Pro. And right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you use my promo code. Just go to canva.me slash scared to get your free 45-day extended trial. That's c-a-n-v-a dot m-e slash scared. Canva.me slash scared. So I was backing up the photos on my phone today and I found some which I took the day of the incident. And I gave it some thought and decided why not share it on here, being anonymous and all that. Maybe this can serve as a PSA of sorts. Always trust your gut feeling. So last year I was living by myself at the time, before my partner and I moved in together that is. For some background too, my partner used to work very hectic shifts, sometimes he would finish at 5pm, sometimes 6pm, sometimes 9pm and he would let me know if he'd be dropping by that day, though he usually wouldn't be able to give me a time but at least I knew that he'd be coming by. It was around 8pm and I was upstairs in the bedroom just working on an embroidery project. I had my airpods in so I wasn't too aware of what was going on around me. I remember feeling the bed rattle though since my bedroom was right above the front door, so whenever someone closed the door, seeing as it was very old and heavy, it always rattled my bed frame. This would usually indicate my partner had arrived. I didn't immediately go downstairs to greet him as I really wanted to finish off the piece of embroidery that I was working on. It was about five minutes before I took out my airpods and proceeded to make my way out of my bedroom and onto the stair landing. I was about to call out for him too when I realized that he didn't leave his work jacket or work boots in the entry. And he knew full well that I don't like shoes, especially work boots, all over my carpeted floors. I assume that I must have imagined feeling the bed shake then. So I went back into my bedroom and was about to put my airpods back in when I very distinctly heard a big crash come from downstairs. It sounded like something very heavy was just dropped. I immediately freaked out and called my boyfriend's name down from my bedroom doorway, but I got no reply. I sure as heck started hearing heavy footsteps though pacing towards the entryway. My gut feeling was that something here was very wrong. I turned, grabbed my phone from the bed, and bolted to the bathroom which was the only room in the house with a lock. 
I called the police and as I started hearing those same heavy footsteps make their way up the stairs, I have never, ever been so scared of those creaking sounds coming from the stairs, but it was different then. At the time, it felt as if uh, I've never heard a scarier sound to be honest. As I was on the phone to the police, the only thing that I could tell the lady on the phone was my address over and over again. I was more focused on how I was going to get out of there to be honest. I wasn't going to wait and see what would happen or who this person was so I flung open my small bathroom window and feet first slid down into the lower floor. My adrenaline was so high I had to momentarily put my phone into my bra as I had no pockets and needed both my hands too. I just remember hearing the police dispatcher keep asking over and over if I'm okay and what was happening. I didn't even have time to tell her what I was doing. It just felt as though my body had gone into autopilot. Once I was on the bottom roof, I lowered myself again, now onto the pavement. As I fell, right onto my knees no less, I got right up and bolted it down the street. It was completely dark with it being mid-October as well. The dispatcher was still on the phone when I finally got onto it again and I told her whilst running that there was someone in my home and how I just jumped out of the window to get away. I ran for what felt like forever until the lady on the phone said to focus on finding a shop where I could go into and wait for the police. I remembered my boyfriend and told the lady that I needed to call him. I made it to a Tesco Express by then and though she wanted to keep me on the phone, I said that I needed to make sure my partner didn't go into my home and potentially risk running into the other person. I got in contact with my partner who had just finished work. It was around 9pm by then and was driving to my house no less. I told him what happened and he instead started heading towards the shop that I was outside of. I felt such relief when he got here too. I remember taking a picture of my scratched up knees and when I got into the car for some reason I got very fixated on them. My partner called the police back for me as the shock started setting in and he let them know that he was with me. It took some time before the police finally arrived at my home. I was told that my front door was left wide open and in the living room the side table had been knocked over. My home wasn't ransacked but it did look as though someone booked it out of there relatively quickly. Upstairs, my bathroom door was kicked in so hard that the door frame itself was indented in though nothing was stolen, mind you. Once they looked over the place, I was called and told that I could return. A call-out ambulance crew was called in and they looked me over. They sorted out my knees and did some sort of assessment to see if I was okay mentally and told me to go and see my GP the next morning about my knees. Reports and statements were written up and I stayed with my boyfriend for two weeks after that. I had to hire someone to fix my door frame along with having a security system installed as I don't think I'd be able to return without it to be honest. And unfortunately, they never found out who this man was. My neighbours had cameras and all we ever figured out about this person was that he was a man who just walked right into my home like it was his. Zero hesitation. My front door was unlocked as I was expecting my partner to arrive soon. I live in a very safe village, mind you, and leaving the door unlocked was a very common occurrence. Though, after this, I've never left it unlocked since. I still live here with my partner and two dogs now, and the man has never come back. Though, we have quite obvious cameras around the property, along with visible security company signage, so that's probably why. But this was easily the most terrifying experience that I've had in my life. It's really hard to, to describe or tell to people because it's like I wasn't in control of my own body when this was happening. Like I said, autopilot went on and all I knew was that I needed to get out of there quickly. So three days ago, my old man went out of town. The first night, I heard what I assumed was a large critter. This is a long story, but recent. I want to say that I'm glad that they left or knew that I was armed, or not worth dying or killing. Whatever the reason, I'm just glad that they left. 
So two nights ago, I was awoken by my dog between 11 and 3 a.m. and at most. He kept near me when I got up and made a low, aggressive sort of growl face out of my room but kept close to me. He's never really done this before, mind you. I've worked with canines for years and this just gave me a gut feeling and that was when I heard it. Someone talking. In my yard, like no more than 20 feet by the sound. Low mumbling, sort of bad whispering. I was blaring Return of the King, yes, the extended version. And I need to add that I have really good hearing at my age. If you can speak in like a floor home with two doors closed at like a whisper, I can usually still make out the words. Anyway, he went quiet when I opened a drawer too loud to grab my hidden 380. I chambered around and I noticed a shadow passing by the light outside the blurred window, a blackout curtains. The home was clear, all the doors were locked, but nothing odd, so my dog peeled out. I held my flashlight in one hand, went his way and called him to the other side. And he was gone. I guess they knew that I was home and ran on foot or something. I went around but thought, okay, I'm good. Well, Florida continues to be Florida, I guess. Night three, my dog does this again in the same frame, waking me up. At this rate, I just got the 12 gauge. My dog was acting far more protective and gave me the dog body language for major threat, need the pack, can't handle alone sort of thing. I froze for a moment. There were two people now. This is not good. They must intend to violently take whatever they want. It was one new guy and definitely the other guy that I saw the other night. I can't really risk getting a look or anything. At this rate, they definitely mean business and had to be armed to scope out a place with a, a ring of like 60 pounds of muscle of dog and me with a lifetime of handling guns. And I mean, they were in the yard at around 2.30 in the morning for a second night. They knew that I and my dog were home, but clearly they had a goal. This time, the voices were behind the home though. My dog then pulled a, a Leroy Jenkins on me. He gave off the most aggressive loud bark that I've ever seen any dog do and ran to the wall. I ran to his side and yelled, they're dead men. It was at this point that things were clicking for me too. This was planned and professional. I checked every inch of the property with the shotgun. My dog was worked up and spooked, but definitely calming. But in the end, we couldn't find anything. I'll definitely be buying a mistake for this one though, and a good one too. I went inside. I literally kept the gun on me, chambered, and on reach of my bed too, and I barely slept. Day four, I did a bit of looking around for like misplaced or slightly moved objects or scratches or anything like that. And yeah, one trash can by the gate was rotated 180 degrees. It had the handle facing me, not the wall as it's always been placed. There were also a few crushed twigs as I went back there. The head chair was turned and moved to the right. A clearly odd thing too is that table set is symmetrical, so it's glaringly obvious out of place if you lived here. I did the ring and my neighbors so far have shown nothing, but I knew these guys had to have known that he left. I knew that his son lived there too. The dog would eat them. It's huge. I had a gun and I even announced that I was armed. Yet... Whoever this person was came back with backup too. Also, he definitely moved stuff that I didn't know until my marine buddy told me to check to see if there was any rocks out of place or anything like that. It's a way to apparently gauge the person's awareness and presence, I guess, but whatever their goal was, I'm pretty confident that it was not good. When I was a child, I was extremely afraid of the dark. I would go sleep on the floor of my parents' room, or sometimes my sister's, when the fear became too much for me. I think most kids are afraid of the dark to some extent, right? But I had experiences that caused the fear, you see. And I would like to share one of the strangest experiences that I ever had. So my parents were divorced. I only saw my dad like every other weekend. 
My sister and I usually go to his house together, and when I'd get scared, I would go sleep on her floor. One particular weekend, I went by myself, and there was something about that house that just really creeped me out, especially at night. It was bedtime, and I was laying in my bed trying to ignore all of the little creaks and the noises of an old house, and what sounded like footsteps, when the fear just finally got too much to me. I had to go and sleep on my dad's floor, and I went to his bedroom door, only to discover that it was locked. I was so scared that I had to get in there no matter what, though. He had a door that could be unlocked with a penny, so I went back to my room to retrieve a coin so I could break in and sleep safely on his floor. I went across the hall to his door and went to unlock it, when the handle started to turn slowly to the right and then to the left. I checked the handle again to find that it was now unlocked. I thought that maybe it was my dad, but when I opened the door, and this only took like a second, he was in bed sound asleep. And there's just no way that he would have had any time to get from the door back to his bed that quickly. I ran back to my room and grabbed my pillow and blankets and just as I left my room, the door behind me slammed shut. I was terrified at this point. The slamming door woke my dad up too and I tried explaining what just happened but he was just irritated and didn't want to hear it. He told me to just lay down on his floor and go to sleep and so that's what I did. The next morning, I discovered that my bedroom door was actually locked from the inside. So, not only did the door slam shut by itself, but it was also locked. Looking back on this experience, as terrifying as it was, it does seem benevolent. I was scared and wanted somewhere safe to go, and the door to the safe place was unlocked for me, while the place that I was terrified to be was closed off and locked, so... Whatever this thing was, it seemed to be looking out for me. I don't know, but all I do know is that it's a memory that will stick with me for as long as I live. This happened several years ago, but much of it is still fresh in my mind. My husband's son and I, we were visiting a local park with a great playground and a long paved sort of trail next to the lake. Hubby would stay with my kiddo while he played and I would walk the dog and listen to a podcast. This park was usually very busy, but this was early spring and the weather wasn't really great. The sky was grey and the wind off the lake still had a bit of a nip to it. I didn't let that deter me though and... I had serious cabin fever and was ready to stretch my legs, so me and my pup B set off. It had been, I would say 15-20 minutes when I noticed my dog sort of acting strange. She was pulling on the leash a lot and seemed almost anxious. At this point I realized that I was almost completely alone. Almost. You see, I glanced back and there were two men. I'll refer to them as Man A and Man B, walking behind me at a pretty quick clip. Now, there was nothing outwardly strange about them, mind you. I just sort of shrugged off my unease and told myself that I must just be paranoid. I slowed a bit and let them pass me, which they did. I felt immediately better once they were well ahead of me too. But they were a ways away, but in my line of sight, as I walked, several minutes later, they stopped and man A leaned and whispered something in man B's ear. Man B nodded and started walking ahead while man A turned around and started walking back towards me. I did find it weird, but sort of just explained it away in my mind, I think. I mean, maybe he has to leave. Maybe he has to go to the bathroom. Maybe he isn't feeling well. As he passed, though, we made eye contact, and as a reflex, I smiled and nodded at him. But the smile I got back... It made my skin crawl, and looking back, I remember that my dog distinctly positioned herself between me and him. I kept walking for a while, I knew at this point I probably should have turned back, but I didn't. And for the next five minutes or so, everything was fine. 
But then I realized that I couldn't see Man B anymore. But there was a bathroom right next to the trail, so he likely was in there. And as I'm processing this, my dog is pulling on the leash and looking behind us. And Man A is coming up fast. Not quite running, mind you, but definitely speed walking. I decided to sit down on a bench and be on the phone with my husband when he passed. I put him on speaker and made sure to loudly say, Yeah, I'm turning around now. Should be back shortly. And at that moment, my dog, who is truly the friendliest dog in the world and will love anyone who will scratch her behind the ears, lunged at this man snarling and barking. She's part Norwegian elk hound, so her bark is pretty jarring. But she had never once done anything like this in the six plus years that I'd had her. The man sidestepped and sort of scurried away. And as soon as he was far enough away that I thought that I wasn't going to get tackled from behind, I got up and booked it all the way back to my husband. Now, maybe it was nothing. Maybe I was just being paranoid and worked myself up over nothing. But I don't know. My dog has never reacted like that. And the fact that these men were sort of disappearing and then reappearing like that, the whole thing seemed very fishy. I really believe that if my dog doesn't like you though, it's for a good reason. So, I'm a pretty typical teenager from Japan, male. And ever since I can remember... I have throughout my lifetime had reoccurring encounters with some strange people. Be it in terms of looks or behavior, these encounters can happen anywhere from a week's space to several months even. And it always seems like when I do, it was their intention to meet me. I know that sounds weird, but let me explain. So my most recent one was on my way home from school. During my walk, I was looking down at my phone for a short moment, about to text one of my friends that I planned to have over at my house later. And as I looked up, a young man looking like he was maybe in his 20s was approaching me a few meters ahead. This confused me for a minute, as it was a straight and fairly long path ahead. I thought to myself that while I may have been looking at my phone, I would have surely have noticed him coming from the corner of the path a good length away. Or at least I expected him to be closer to that corner or something. But there he was, approaching me from the middle as if he had appeared from almost thin air. His hair was dark brown, a bit unkempt, but still pretty good looking and he had green eyes. His clothes were fairly ordinary too, keeping a sort of laid back summer style to it I guess. But the most remarkable thing about him was his tattoo, or maybe it was a mark per se or something. In any case, it was a black line running from his left chin and down to underneath his shirt. As he got close enough for conversation, he sort of stopped me and asked for my name. When I told him, he said that he'd heard about me before. But this obviously really confused me, as I'm not exactly like a celebrity or anything, but I didn't think too much of it. We then had some like boring small talk, but he genuinely seemed pretty cheerful. Just as he was about to take off too, he told me that I should probably wait for my friend. He didn't give me much of a chance to respond to this before just walking off in the direction that he came from. I thought about what he said and turned around to walk back to school. I sort of glanced behind my back not long after, only to find that he was nowhere to be seen. As I made it back to my school, sure enough I find my friend waiting by the gate she apparently thought that we were going to walk to my place together and had been waiting for me for a quite a long time. I apologized and we began walking and, well, that's pretty much the end of it. I obviously didn't tell her about the encounter, but I thought about it when she left. Because I didn't even tell him or hint about my friend at all, so how would he have known? These are the types of encounters that have kept on happening, like throughout my whole life, sometimes very frequently too, and I just don't know why. These people I meet just seem so not real, and usually know something that I've never told them about, which leads me to believe that these people aren't human at all.
I might post more stories if anybody would be interested in them, but I would like to know if somebody might have some answers, I guess, to who or what this could be, and why I keep encountering them. When I was about 20, I moved out of home and into a share house with about five other flatmates. Generally, at any given time, there were six people living in the five-bedroom house, but one of the rooms had two beds. Now, during my 10 months stay there, I probably had about 25 different flatmates due to the high turnover. Some were travelers, backpacking around Australia, and would only stay a few weeks before moving on. But I had a good friend in there, around the same age as me. Her name was Jenny, who moved in shortly after I did. We were always joking about the many colourful characters that we'd encountered during our stay. Jenny and I both had the largest rooms in the house that were near the front, and in between our rooms was a tiny space that us flatmates used to call the broom closet. It was big enough for a bunk bed, and that was about all really, and whoever stayed in there would store their stuff under the bunk. Now one day, shortly after the broom closet had become vacant again, a Brazilian guy named Marcel, who I think was about 38 years old, rocked up and moved in. He seemed fun enough at first, I guess. He was always stoned and in a good mood and always sharing stuff with everyone. Our house was always a bit of a party house with drinking and smoking being pretty common here as well. But over the next several weeks... Marcel's attitude changed from this happy-go-lucky guy to sort of increasingly paranoid and angry. I remember him breaking down crying one night and he kept saying, the children are dying, the children are dying, and just didn't know how to help him. Another time he lashed out at us all and it was bizarre and I remember coming home one time and he was in his room with the door open but... I didn't want to look in, so I hurried to my room, but on the way, I heard him making these strange sort of grunting noises. It sounded almost animalistic too, and eventually his erratic behavior and mood swings got to a point where the rest of us flatmates spoke to the landlords, and they came and asked him to leave. He packed up his stuff, and as he was leaving, he pointed to us and said, God would judge us all one day. After he'd gone, Jenny and I went to check out the broom closet as we'd never seen it while it was empty. And I noticed next to the bunk, near where a person would lay their head to sleep, there was a small hole in the wall. It was just big enough that when you put your eye near it, you could see Jenny's entire room and it overlooked her bed. Next to the hole was a faint but grubby looking man's handprint. There were also stains further down the wall towards the other end of the bed, and Jenny was horrified to realize that Marcel had been watching her in her bedroom all this time, and also appeared to have been playing with himself. I was disgusted as well, and I mean, it was truly disturbing. We were pretty sure that he must have created the hole himself as well, as before he moved in, a young girl stayed in that room and she had never mentioned it. We both moved out shortly after this though, but during our time in that house, I'd say that that was definitely the creepiest encounter that we'd had while we were living there. For as long as I can remember, I have been haunted by a very tall black figure. I have vivid memories of him creeping up the ladder on the bunk bed that I shared with my twin sister. I never saw his face, he was just a black shadow that sort of disappeared when I looked directly at him, but I always got this image, I guess, in my mind when he was around. I don't really know how to explain it, but I know what he looked like. I can picture his face in my mind, but I never actually saw his face. He, for the most part, left me alone. It was just a very, very creepy thing. Once when I was downstairs very late at night though, I turned the kitchen light, the hallway light, and the light for the stairs on because I always did this because I was scared of the dark. I think this unexpected disturbance sort of made him mad or something too because I turned off the lights as I was going back upstairs. My parents were sticklers about turning lights off. 
And right after I turned the stair light off, I saw him behind me in the mirror at the end of the hallway with very bright red sort of ominous eyes. I could almost feel the anger too, and this was the only time that I sort of directly saw him. There were more small incidences in that house, but that was the worst. I moved out of my parents' house, though, with my now husband, and he, the shadow, followed me to my new house. He only stayed in one area, though, and it was a, a lot more subtle. He stayed in our laundry room, which had no door. The whole house had no doors, in fact. We were broke 18-year-olds. Don't judge. We didn't have a washer, a dryer, so we used it for storage, pretty much. The laundry room was directly across from my room and had a perfect view of me while I was sleeping. It wasn't so bad, I guess. I could just feel him sort of watching me sometimes, and I slept in the living room a lot anyway. But my husband and I got pregnant with our son, so we moved to a bigger and better house. It had doors, thankfully, and the shadow came along too. Again, he only stayed in one area of the house, the room that was going to be my son's nursery, mind you. My son wasn't born yet, so obviously I wasn't in that room very often, and once my son came, I kept the baby in my room 95% of the time because I was really nervous. First time mum and potential SIDS really scared me. But the man only appeared in the nursery, and I never actually saw him. I just sort of felt like he was there. I don't remember if I felt him in that house after my son was born... I was a huge ball of anxiety as a first time mum so I didn't notice a lot of things and honestly barely remember my son's first few months. But my anxiety level was not normal first time mum anxiety too. I was like in survival mode constantly and scared of not being a good enough mum and all that stuff. So I don't know if the haunting stopped when I had my son or and I know this sounds a bit silly but I turned 20 just a month before my son was born so I technically wasn't a child anymore myself. I'm really not sure. It just stopped and I no longer see or feel this thing. I haven't in a long time now. I wish that I could remember the exact time that I felt his presence, but I don't. I moved again when my son was seven months old and I haven't seen or felt anything ever since. So, this wasn't an encounter with a person, but something that I found with my kiddo in the woods. It was hair, like 20 inches of human hair, in the campfire ring. I spotted it right away because it was so unusual to see. It wasn't burned, but carefully put under three or four medium-sized rocks. I moved the rocks and used a big stick to investigate, hoping that I wouldn't see a scalp or skin included hoping that it was a wig and someone thought that they would be funny, but no. It was blonde hair with washed out blue dye about halfway through it. I tried to turn it over using the stick as much as I could, making sure that it wasn't attached to a scalp or worse. But man, it smelt rotten like decay. And it is the absolute creepiest thing that I've come across in the woods. So unsettling that I did report it to the sheriff's department because I felt someone with authority should know. I talked to the deputy and sent him the pictures that we took with detailed instructions to get to the campsite. There's been no follow-up so far, but it's totally ruined our Sunday drive. I don't know if someone was just shaving their head and howling at the moon in the woods or what, but it looked to be a bit more than that and it was disturbing for sure. I would like to start by saying that I'm 22 and my family has had crazy experiences with ghosts and the otherworldly for generations apparently. So for the most of my life, I have lived in haunted houses. Even before I was born, my brothers lived in them and my parents lived in them too. And just generations on both sides of the family have dealt with this. My family are very religious, so it doesn't bother them and they can ignore it. However, I'm not so lucky. 
My family are very sensitive to energies. My family are sensitive to energies. My mum is a premonition dreamer. My dad can see ghosts and me and my siblings. We're a bit of a mixture of both. We do not go searching for houses that specifically are haunted or anything. Now, let me just state that. But somehow, we always get the haunted unit or house. But we never had a, a harsh haunting, I guess you could call it. Until I was 12 and we lived in a small three-bedroom house. That house was very active. I saw a ghost walk directly into my room one day and my cousin was sleeping over that night and she saw it too. Every house before this small one though was like simple shadows in the corner of your eye sort of thing or the previous owners dealt with spirit work. But we had no idea what this house was. Footsteps in the crawl space or the attic... Florida houses don't have real attics, by the way. But doors opening, locks being unlocked, shadows walking into the rooms, walking past us even, nightmares of being chased. But we couldn't explain why it was happening or deny that it was happening too. We lived there for four to five years, I think. We left when I turned 13 and moved into a townhouse that had something malicious in it. And it turned my family against each other and it drove me to the breaking point. In that house, uh, I was also diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And this actually broke me because I was no longer sure if I ever saw ghosts or if I was crazy. Thankfully, my entire family reassured me that, yeah, all this stuff actually happened in that house and that's probably what triggered this coming out of me. This house has had shadows standing in doorways, stopping our laundry, calling our names, walking in the mirrors... And it made us all angry with one another. It never came out and attacked us, I think, because we were a religious family and all that stuff. But it was definitely still there. We moved from there, though, when I turned 18. And for a good three years, we were good. We just moved into a new apartment, though. And it's me, my parents, my husband, and my little brother, and my cat. We moved in to save money, so my folks got the bigger unit. And I swear that this unit has something. When I'm alone, I just I feel like I'm being watched. I've had things moved when I turn my back. I always feel the presence of someone there and I started seeing shadows move in the dark too. I know that it's not my schizophrenia too because I know when I have my episodes and I'm high functioning. And my cat notices something too, but then she sort of ignores it and I guess I feel safer at that point. I also switched religions years ago and I'm now technically a pagan, I guess. I cleanse, I smudge, I try to ward off spirits when I feel unsafe, but whatever this thing is, it's still here. It seems to only really bother me, but it does it when other people are around too. Like, other people have experienced things for sure. I ignore it if nobody else senses it, but it's there, watching me. Anyway... I just wanted to share this experience and I want to know if anybody else has been through something like this. My family isn't wealthy and I assumed why we always got the haunted places was because of low income situations. I don't know. I just hope that it stops when my husband and I get our own place. Because at the moment, I hate being alone. This is my first time sharing this anywhere, so I apologize if details get a little bit confusing, but I'll try my best to make it as concise as possible. So this happened a few months ago to my friends and I. We were university students in Cape Town, South Africa, so when we weren't trying to get through the semester, we liked to let our habits get the better of us and go out for drinks. And this night... We had just finished what felt like an extra long day at university and decided to head to a bar about five minutes from campus for some much needed stress relief. The evening was going well, although a bit slow. It was enjoyable with everyone having a drink and getting a bit restless though. So me being one of the more outgoing ones in the group, I suggested that we head to the pool bar not far from where we were. Everyone agrees and we get our stuff and we go. But we all jump in my car and we head to the bar but being a Thursday night, parking was definitely scarce. But I finally managed to find a spot about a block away from the bar, in a secluded side street. 
I should also mention that this bar is one of the sketchier parts of town, but is normally quite safe due to the amount of nightlife associated with being so close to a university. We walked to the bar and no one really felt uneasy, nor did anything happen to make us feel that way, which was quite surprising to be honest. After a few hours of some pool and just sort of relaxing, we decided that it was time to grab some dinner before restaurants close, as being in South Africa means that most restaurants, even fast food, close really early at around like 7pm or 8pm to comply with the curfew. But we ended up deciding to stop at the pizza place below the bar to grab some food before we all decided what the plan for the end of the night was. Because our group was so large and the pizza place being so small, we decided to have those getting food go inside while the others would just sort of wait outside on the street. This was an easy decision too as the pizza place had a massive open window with built-in counters so we could all still talk to each other and order and everything. But this is where things started getting a little weird. So while we're waiting for our friends inside the pizza place to come out, this massive white van pulls up past us and just sort of stops. The driver wasn't an intimidating looking dude by any means. He was skinny, looked to be about average height with shoulder long blonde hair. A pretty standard looking dude for the kind of area that we were in. And he calls me and asks if I think his van could fit in the parking spot just behind him. For perspective too, this parking spot could probably fit like a small hatchback, maybe. This dude is driving a full long size panel van. This definitely makes me kind of easy too as I thought that as a driver of a car that you would know where your car could definitely not fit. And this was one of them for sure. But I explained to him that I didn't think that it was even worth attempting. He responds telling me that he has faith in his ability and I should come and stand behind the van and direct him in. This gives me major red flags. And after a few back and forths, he just pulls the emergency brake up and sits and stares at my friends and I for what felt like a long time. Then, he just sort of thanked us and drove off. This sparks my friends to come outside from the pizza place as they just saw what happened and they were very confused like we were. We're all kind of weirded out, but try not to think too much of it and... Everyone eats their pizza and we try to decide what the plan is for the last hour or two that we have before curfew cuts things short. Most of us decide that this is where the night is going to end as we're all kind of weirded out by this guy in the van and the vibe has changed. A few others decided that they were going to stay and just Uber home a little later in the evening. With our group number cut down to four though, we decided to walk back to the car and just sort of head home. When we left the pizza place... A homeless person called us and was insisting that we had nothing to worry about with the guy in the van, which really didn't help with anyone's nerves, obviously. We then decided to head to the car, but as soon as we turn the corner to approach the side street where the car was parked, we see Van Man again. This time, not quite so happy as he seemed in the encounter earlier. I made a cheeky comment about him finally finding a parking spot that he could fit in, while we were walking past each other and he just stared at my friends and I not breaking eye contact even when we passed him. I turned around to see if he was still looking, he was, but as we turned the corner of the side street with the car I saw it and my heart sank. The van horribly parked half on and half off the sidewalk, back door slightly open. Upon seeing this I turned around and see the van man is now walking towards us but he said something that confused me at first, but immediately made sense after. He said, hey, please just watch my car, which confused me, but when he said that, four men sat up from leaning on the wall next to it and began following us. My friends and I were slightly ahead of them, so we were trying to discuss the game plan because it was obvious if we did nothing, something horrible was about to happen. My friends started walking faster and I remained at the same speed, frantically searching my pockets for my car keys, all while shouting at my friends to wait up and asking what the rush was, all in hopes that the guys behind us, who were gaining on us now, were oblivious to us knowing that they had sinister intentions. As soon as the car came into view, we booked it, jumped in, drove away, but we were honestly only seconds from not being that lucky. After locking the doors, I saw the men surrounding the car. Thankfully, I managed to get us out of there, but 
Looking in the back mirror, I saw a fifth man by the van at the bottom of the street. I still don't know the full intentions of what they had planned that night was. Maybe it was just to rob us or beat us up and take something, or maybe it was a lot worse than that. I don't really like to think about how lucky we were that night, because when I do, it gives me chills. All I ask is that when you're out, no matter how innocent an interaction with someone can seem, always pay attention to the little things. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give BetterHelp a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, is there something stopping you from achieving your goals? Is there something that gets in the way of you feeling happy or successful? Well, BetterHelp can help you with this. BetterHelp is a safe and private online environment where you can connect securely with a professional counsellor. They're a wonderful organisation that offers some truly impressive flexibility. From their ability to start communicating with their clients in under 48 hours, to their service being available worldwide, it really is amazing just how much they can do. You can send messages to your counsellor anytime and get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions too. And all without ever having to sit in those mind-numbing waiting rooms. Oh, and uh, to be clear as well, BetterHelp is not a crisis line, it's not a self-help line, it is professional counselling done securely online. BetterHelp is also more affordable than traditional offline counselling, and even financial aid is available if you need assistance with that. Everything you share is completely confidential, and you can also check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. In fact, there are so many people now using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counsellors in all 50 states. I was super impressed myself with their professionalism when I spoke to my therapist about some of my goals and how to work through some of the challenges I'm having with my sleep schedule, or lack thereof at the moment. It was great just airing out my frustrations and thinking through what else I could do. So, I want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash be scared. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash B-E-S-C-A-R-E-D. Betterhelp.com slash be scared. So this event took place on a local hiking trail that I wasn't too fond of. I won't name the trail itself for privacy reasons, but I will say that it's here in Southern Cali. I went with two friends, and for the sake of their privacy too, their names for this story will be Jaslyn and Vivian. So this trail is a 40 minute drive away from our hometown, and this was unplanned like most of our hikes were in destinations too. We arrived approximately at 6pm, and we were all aware that the time that we finish up the trail it was going to be dark. But we start walking, and we've been walking for about 20 minutes, and this guy with a pretty large stick passes by and tells us to be very careful because of the snakes being present. Just by the look on his face, it looked like he was pretty petrified too. Now, I normally run into rattlesnakes on hikes, and yes, they tend to look a bit scary, but just give them their space and they'll leave you alone. I didn't acknowledge much of what he said, but he hands me the stick that he was holding, and I give it to Jaslyn. Normally I would have just thrown it away, but for some reason I told Jaslyn just to keep it. The whole situation was a little bit weird for me, and telling her was also weird to hold onto the stick like that, but I just ignored the weird thoughts, and we just kept going. After walking for an additional 10 minutes, we run into this couple, and normally we greet people on the way up and down the hill. And the couple asked us if we had flashlights, and we replied with yes. That's when I asked them too how far away we were from the springs. And the man said that it's about another 25 minutes away. We part ways from them and proceed to walk. At this point, the sun has finally set, and it's beginning to get dark. Jaslyn bought her taser, a light, and hairspray. Vivian brought her flashlight, and we had a pretty decent view thanks to the light provided. But this is when things begin to go south. We're literally only five minutes away from reaching the springs, and as soon as we step one foot closer, an adult rattlesnake almost falls onto Jaslyn's head. It slithers away pretty fast, but strangely enough, the entire environment just started to feel ominous all of a sudden. Jaslyn and Vivi were also feeling the same way. 
I am usually the friend who perennially likes to brush off any thought of fear or negativity. I just don't like to automatically jump to conclusions. But now, I was feeling weird, I must admit. Jaslyn, on the other hand, gets a little frightened when anything scary happens. And yes, that includes running into animals like snakes. As far as I know, Vivi hasn't really experienced anything terrifying, or just an event in particular that makes one genuinely feel fear, that is. But given the situation and the ominous feeling and it being completely dark by now, we decide that it's probably best to just head back. To give a better idea to on how steep it was going downhill, it was dangerous to the point where one wrong step can make you fall off the clip or slip and get badly injured. Even trying to run during the day is a really big risk. The paths were really narrow and we had to walk behind each other. But fast forward 10 minutes since we've been walking and we reach one part of the trail that is the steepest. Naturally, I'm used to power walking fast, going along with the flow. Vivi was pacing herself going a little slower and Jaslyn stayed in the middle. I start moving the taser's mini flashlight and all of a sudden see a blurry figure standing in the corner of the trail. I begin to slow down but I wasn't going too fast to begin with. I had stopped right in front of it and this is when I noticed that Jaslyn and Vivi were left a little bit behind. I move the flashlight up towards the figure's face and it revealed this putrid looking guy. It looked like he hadn't showered in months and man did it scare the heck out of me. I greeted the man in sarcasm hoping to get a bit of feedback from this guy but nothing. No response whatsoever. He just stares at me with this deranged blank expression. At the time he really made me feel unsettled. He looked high on something for sure and I know for a fact that it wasn't weed. Jaslyn and Vivi get closer and that's when I hear Vivi jokingly say, I'm surprised you didn't tase him. Even after hearing that, still no response from this guy though. This is when I began to look at him from head to toe just to see if he has a weapon of some sort. The entire time he had one hand in his pants and the other outside. But this is when I finally noticed that he was wearing black gloves. To give a description on how the man looked too, he had really long greasy hair, really dirty pants with bleach stains all over it I think, a big oversized hoodie and a ripped beanie, and to top it all off, he also didn't have a flashlight. It was at least 8.30pm now and there was just no way that he could see and walk around the dark with no light like that especially since his trail is almost impossible to walk around at night. And obviously, every single red flag possible started going off in my head. My unsettling feeling starts to rise and I'm pretty sure at this point, the man can see the fear all over my face. This is also when Jaslyn tells me in Spanish that she's more afraid of this guy than the snakes. I told her to stay quiet and turn off the music. Uh, the music. She'd had music playing softly the whole time back. But this is exactly the point when Jaslyn and I began to run. I didn't really notice that Vivi was left behind too, but I just kept running. I was too scared to process the eerie encounter. Uh, Vivi gets a little freaked out and Jaslyn and I had to calm her down. I started to lose a little bit of patience when she wanted to stop and stand for a few minutes, but she was just in complete denial and refused to believe that this guy was much of a threat. I couldn't bear standing around too, so I began to walk quickly. Luckily, Jaslyn managed to convince Vivi to move forward too, but the rest of the hike, luckily for us, was okay, besides the occasional slipping and tripping. And once we got back to the car, we... Pretty much all said it. That guy, he definitely gave off those serial killer vibes, if that's a thing. Anyway, after that incident, I pretty much promised to myself that I would never, ever return there at night, ever again. I live in France and this story happened to me this summer, just after the lockdown ended, and I was 19 at that time. 
After the lockdown ended, I went to my grandparents to spend a few weeks there. I got tested before and there were no problems. My grandparents live in a small city in the north of France and they have a dog who's quite a big dog. When I was really young, I lived at my grandparents for a year and at that time the dog was only a puppy. Her name is Chippy in French, which kind of means little devil in English, but in a sort of a, an affectionate way. Considering when I was living there though, I played with her a lot, but suffice it to say that we're both really close and this will have its importance later. So two of my hobbies are having long walks and running. Thus, every evening I was out for a long walk with the dog. There's a track that follows a path through the forest there too that's sort of on a small hill and on top of that a big place with lots of fields there. I actually run there a lot so I know the place pretty well. The air is fresh and the view is beautiful, so I was going to go there with the dog every day. And it was also helping my grandparents to have her doing lots of exercise. But the first time we went there too, nothing special happened. We just enjoyed our walk. It's about six to seven kilometers, so basically an hour's walk. And the next day, when we arrived on the top of the hill in the field, it was probably around 10 p.m., but there was still some light because it was summer. But there were three other people walking in the fields. They were younger than me, probably about 15 or 16. I also noticed that they were smoking, so my guess was that they used to come up here so that they couldn't be seen by their parents. But we went past them, and I greeted them, and they greeted me back. Once again, nothing special. In fact, for a whole week I did this walk around the same time, 10pm, and even passed by those three guys with nothing else happening. The second week, as usually I went for the walk with the dog Chippy and I arrived at the fields, there were only one of those three boys. He wasn't smoking this time though and when he saw me, I was at the entrance of the field just after the little hill climb so the entrance of the forest was just behind me. He did a sign with his hand to catch my attention and asked if I had a lighter which I actually had in my pocket so I told him yeah sure and he walked with me, his hand in the pockets of his hoodie. And when he came near, for some reason, I just felt a shiver. It's crazy, too, how sometimes your instincts just know that there's a problem, but often we don't listen to them, right? Because nothing looks weird. I handed over the lighter, though, and when he passed by, at that moment, my dog was staring at him. And then... Everything just happened so quickly. He did a really fast movement with his hand coming from his hoodie and I only saw something shining. I was just quick enough to throw myself back and I fell hard on the floor. And I quickly realized that it was a knife that he was holding and he had just tried to stab me. And what actually saved me was my dog. God bless her. Because when she saw the guy trying to stab me, she jumped on him and he fell down. As I said before, it's a really big dog. I immediately got up to my feet though and I heard something from behind me. From the entrance of the forest, I saw two guys wearing animal masks running at me. I surmised quickly that these were probably his two friends. Now, in this moment, your brain acts for itself and you don't think at all and... And in this case, the answer that I found was really simple. The other guy was still on the ground. I just watched my dog and I told her, run. And I started running and she followed me, but I heard the worst possible thing from the guy who got up as well, because he said, catch him and don't let him go. At this moment, I was totally terrified. I was running and running. I was hearing them running behind me. I was only thinking, how long will they follow me and who the heck are they? This was the first time that I was really happy to be a runner too. I was clearly better than these guys and I think that that actually saved me this day because they chased me for what felt like an eternity really. But fortunately though, at the end of the field, there's another entrance to the forest and this time it descends to the road at the end. I heard the steps of the three guys vanishing as I arrived at the end of the forest though I didn't stop running until I arrived at my grandparents' house and I locked myself in. I caught my breath and I gave my dog a huge hug. I saw in her eyes that she totally understood what had happened and 
I've never been so happy to have her in my life. After that, I told everything to my grandparents and we called the police, but unfortunately they didn't find anyone. I really don't know what those guys wanted, but the animal masks, they really made me think about some kind of Satanism or cult or something. I really don't want to know either way, but it was weird. I still do long walks with Chippy, the hero dog, but I now go earlier and to places with a little more people. Please forgive me too if anything I said was spoken a little bit weird, as like I said, I am from France. But uh, thanks for listening. So, I'm not going to provide exact locations for this one, as this happened on the trail that my mum and I used to walk the dog on every day for like 10 years, and as such, it was pretty close to our house. But I lived in a rural part of the PNW, and so there's a lot of trails just outside of town that bordered on a lot of forest. This was one of those, but it was probably the biggest trail in my town. It was actually an access road to some stuff, I think, so it was like 10 feet wide and gravel. And at the time that I briefly went missing, I was about 10 years old and had walked that trail every single day for like three to four years. My mum was with me, as was our dog, 85 pounds, Rottweiler Lab Aussie Mix. I'd been warned not to go off the trail and wouldn't have normally, but there was a small sub-trail that had a rope swing over a creek. I loved to play there as a kid, and that day I crossed the creek, a fallen tree bridge, to hang out on the other side while mum talked to a friend that she ran into. I was within sight of my mum, clear view across the creek, when all of a sudden, it was like things just swirled. My surroundings were completely unfamiliar, and there were plants that shouldn't have been there. The wrong kind of trees with leaves at slightly the wrong point for the season. Of course, I knew what to do if I got lost, I hugged a tree and shouted for my mum. I was probably 300 yards away at absolute most, and maybe under 100 yards. She should have heard me, but she didn't. Thankfully, I wasn't there for very long before our dog came and got me. He wasn't a very smart dog. With all love, saying that he was as dumb as a bag of rocks would have been an insult to the rocks, to be honest. He also didn't like me nearly as much as he liked my mum, totally a mama's boy. It would have stayed near her normally, but he calmly walked up to me, nuzzled my hand so that it was on his head, and then he just walked me back out of the creek where I could see my mum. I thought that I must have been gone for like 15 minutes or so, but apparently it was an hour plus, and multiple people were now looking for me including walking directly on the path that I had never left. So this happened in June of 2018 in Portland, Oregon. I understand too that I acted like an idiot in this situation. Since then, I have become much more observant, cautious, and honestly, just much more paranoid. So, uh, I went dancing with some friends and was really drunk by midnight. Unfortunately, this was back when I had little money and I realized that you could save money by eating very little before going out and it would take far fewer drinks to get drunk. So, I was so drunk that I barely remember my friend ordering me an Uber home. My phone was dead, of course. I can vaguely recall them helping me into the car and telling me to get home safe. I don't remember greeting the driver or the first minute or so, but soon after getting in, he asked how my night was and if I smoked. Honestly, I was just thinking about bed at this point, so I just sort of slurred out that I did sometimes. He then offered me a joint, and this is the first moment that I sort of got nervous and began paying attention. I tell him something like I'm really tired and just ready to get home. I think he said something about it being an indica-based joint and it made for great sleep. Well, once again, I say something not exactly like no, but not a yes, which he takes as a yes, I'll have that joint now. 
Well, once again, I'm still drunk enough that I can barely see straight or speak clearly, so when he says, Okay, well, I have to cancel the ride really quick because I can't give it to you while I'm on the clock, or something to that effect, it takes me a second to realize just how dangerous that is. And by the time that I start to say something, he's already canceled the ride and pulls over. We're in an area just east of Hawthorne Bridge, I think anyway, and it was totally secluded. Some empty parking lots, a closed auto body shop, no one in sight. It's starting to hit me that I'm now in the car and not with an Uber driver, but with some stranger. I can't call anyone and he's trying to give me weed and that could have anything in it. For the next minute or so, we're pretty quiet or I just can't remember any small talk that he tried to make because I was beginning to panic. And every time that he handed me the joint, I would take fake hits, just breathing it into my mouth and not into my lungs. Honestly too, I felt tired and clumsy and weak. That kind of drunk where you're almost at the point of nausea and I knew that I couldn't do much of anything to defend myself at that point. I remember vividly being fixated for a moment on the fact that I didn't even have a pair of keys to defend myself with as my building used fobs for just about everything and I didn't take my mail key with me. As I'm freaking out, I look up to see if this guy is sort of noticing and I make eye contact with him in the mirror. He was staring at me too, but I couldn't read his expression. Finally, he says something along the lines of, well, let's get out of here. I tell him that I'll just call another Uber to get home, thinking at this point that it might even be safer to walk. And he says, no, I still have your address and I'll just take you home. For a moment, I was relieved, to be honest. I guess I wanted to believe him so badly that I would get home safe that I just believed him. So I tried to calm myself down, thinking that he hadn't actually done anything threatening. Maybe he was just your typical stoner guy, and maybe I was just overreacting. At this time, I lived on PSU campus in downtown Portland, in the southwest area of the city. He's driving me north on the east side of the river. There are several bridges to our left, and as he keeps moving north, he has several opportunities to take an exit to hop over the river and get me back downtown. But he just keep skipping them. We keep passing bridge after bridge that could get me home. Up in northeast Portland, there are some large industrial areas that can get very isolated at night, and Portland in general is surrounded by lots of forests, so I knew that he could have me in a secluded area really quickly. After he passes like the fourth exit for a bridge, pretty sure it was the Broadway Bridge, I've been racking my brain for a way to make him actually take me home, and say something to the effect of, hey, my boyfriend is waiting for me at home. Which was actually true, though I said it in a very meek way. My driver says nothing, but he did take the next exit for a bridge, and basically hung a giant U-turn that started taking me home. Even as we're on the west side of town heading south, though, I'm still shaking and have my hand on the door handle, thinking about just hopping out at a red light the closer that we get to my apartment. My phone is completely dead and he honestly still has several chances to hop onto nearby highways and just speed out of the city if he wanted to. We're getting pretty close to my apartment now and I'm once again trying to convince myself that I'm being paranoid about some stoner that can't navigate the city. Although a few times before I was so scared that I was crying. So... Once we get about two blocks from my apartment, I lie and I tell him that it's easiest to stop here and he can let me out. Again, he doesn't say anything but does slow the car. I'm flooded with relief too and even feel myself smile but when I go to open the door, it's locked. I try to lift the lock mechanism manually but it won't budge. I look up at him instinctually to see what's up and... He's got his head turned almost fully toward me, shoulders still facing the road, smiling at me. The worst smile that I've ever seen. It looked so mocking and it just didn't reach to his eyes at all. I just started crying and asking him to open the door. I was so freaked out and still really drunk. And thank God he did. I will never forget the sensation of vulnerability... Not just being drunk in his car with no way to contact anyone, but even as I got out of that car, 
I kept feeling like he would somehow grab the back of my shirt and pull me back in. As silly as that sounds. When I got home, I found out my boyfriend had actually gone out with friends last minute and wasn't even home in the end. He wouldn't have even have known till much later if I hadn't gotten back safely. The next day, though, I convinced myself that I was just freaking out over nothing, which I realized could still be the case, but in my gut, I had truly felt in danger that night. Technically, this guy could have been totally harmless, I know that, but still, I still think I should have texted my friend and had her report him. The big thing, though, that made me think of this was recently hearing about how Ed Kemper, co-ed killer, would go for practice runs, picking up hitchhikers and seeing if he could get the passengers, potential victims, to trust him or how far out of his comfort zone he could push them without them saying anything. Obviously, this guy wasn't Ed Kemper, but I hate wondering if that night was a practice run of sorts for my Uber driver. Anyway... Thanks to whoever has listened to this all the way through, and I'm at the point in my life where I'm realizing just how much danger I put myself in when I was younger, and just honestly depressed. It has made me both surprised and deeply grateful too that I am still here. So I want to start off by saying that I have never experienced anything visual like this before, and if there is a possible explanation, I'm not sure how that could be though, I would like to hear it. So my girlfriend and I are in the process of moving into a basement suite, but we still technically reside at our old place across town for another three days. Her name is the only one on the lease since we've been having some relationship issues due to work stress and also some personal problems. But this basement suite that we moved into had actually been completely gutted and most of the appliances and flooring replaced, except for the bathroom. It's now a city legal suite with its own water heater and stuff like that, since there had apparently been a massive police investigation done a few months prior. We weren't told much about what exactly happened there, other than drug-related incidences, but... I went into the bathroom to do some cleaning yesterday evening and noticed what looks like blood at the bottom of the radiator. It seemed creepy and I didn't want to touch it because, well, it's gross. But anyway, a few hours pass and my girlfriend goes to bed in the bedroom and I fall asleep on the couch watching TV. I woke up at around 4 o'clock in the morning to our cat knocking a plant off the windowsill and messing with the blinds. The lights were off, but I have a big black light aquarium in the living room, which lit up most of the living room and kitchen area. My girlfriend came out of the room to ask what was going on, and I was sort of ticked off, half asleep, and cleaning dirt off the countertops. She told me to just leave it for tomorrow and just come to bed and then walked away. I stayed up and continued cleaning for maybe 20 minutes since there was dirt all over the place. And this is what actually terrifies me, even thinking about it now. So, like I said, I was in the kitchen wiping down the counters. It was pretty dim, but I could still see. It's now around 4.30 in the morning. I turned around towards the garbage can, and my girlfriend is standing in the dark doorway, just staring at me. I couldn't see her face clearly, but it was a six-foot-thin figure, the exact build as my girlfriend. I said, sorry if I'm keeping you up, I'm almost done. She just stood there facing me. I figured that she just was ticked off since we'd been arguing off and on this whole week. So I finished what I was doing and walked past her and asked if she wanted to come to bed. But she didn't move. I walked straight into the bedroom and I closed the door and my girlfriend was laying there sleeping. I, uh... Woke her up by closing the door, and I guess the look on my face scared her enough to make her spring up in bed, wide awake, and ask what happened repeatedly. I started gagging, swearing, and pretty much just lost it for a minute or two. And then I told her that I just saw her in the kitchen. And she said, well yeah, I came out earlier and asked what happened. I told her no, I just walked past her into the bedroom. She pretty much went silent peeked out the door and nothing was there. We both went to sleep a while later after this. 
Now, I don't get strange feelings here at all, which I guess is the weird part, but man, what a trip. I have no idea what that was last night, and it scared me so bad that I almost threw up when I realized that my girlfriend had been sleeping the past half an hour. And I have no idea what to make of any of it. So my mum, my dad and my big sister and I were on holiday at a big family style resort in the 90s. For context too, this actually happened somewhere in a South American country. Now, I've told this story so many times too, but I don't want to dox myself by giving away too many details, so please forgive me if something doesn't quite make sense. But for context, I actually have no recollection of this event, but I do remember parts of the holiday. The sea, the white sand, the banana trees. The four of us were actually staying at one of those classic family hotels. The ones with the buffet breakfast has eggs, bacon, fresh fruits, and pancakes galore. The type where there are also lots of kids and lots of animation for them. There was a kids club too where I could go and I remember making a friend there too. A little boy about my age. Unfortunately though, that's all I sort of really remember. And the rest is all from my dad's recounting. So well, we were in the hotel playing area, my parents and I. A woman working for the hotel part of the kids club animation team was playing with me and... I was a cute little shy blonde kid. She started playing with me and talking to me. My parents relax, enjoy their holiday knowing that their daughter is being entertained by the kids club staff. All good, right? Until my dad turns around and sees that I'm missing. I'm not next to them. The woman playing with me is also nowhere in sight too. With Papa Bear reflexes, my dad stands up to see that the woman is walking slowly but surely across the hotel with his daughter in her arms. He begins chasing her down the hotel and she takes up some speed, beginning to run with me. This was a vast complex though, so there was a long way to go. But my dad says that he ran after her through doors, which she would close in his nose. And by a stroke of luck, he managed to catch up with her just before she made it to the side exit and pulled me out of her hands. In shock, he grabbed me and ran back, letting the woman disappear into a forest nearby. Immediately, my parents went to the hotel to complain and let them know either their staff or somebody pretending to be their staff tried to kidnap me. The hotel, unfortunately, brushed this off casually and said, oh, don't worry about that. This happens sometimes. Crazy, right? Anyway, I hope this hotel has changed since the 90s, but it really makes me think just how messed up it was that the hotel just didn't seem to care. In fact, it was almost like they were in on it too somehow. One evening about five years ago, I'd say now, I traveled to Loch Ness with a friend to see the loch and the surrounding area. We had planned on arriving by afternoon, spend the evening, then head to the hotel when it got dark. That was perfect. Well, we got there too with no problems and we spent the day together just taking in the beautiful landscape. The moon began to rise and so we decided it was time to head back as we had spent the majority of the day there. As my friend began to drive back, she went around a sharp bend and I mean the word to its very meaning, she narrowly avoided a man standing on the edge. She was quite understandably in shock and slammed the brakes in sheer panic. She began to pant, verging on hyperventilation as I tried to calm her down. She had actually believed that she had hit the man when she swerved. Thankfully though, the man was okay as well, we later learned because he walked towards the car and apologized for standing so near the road. After he tried to make some small talk with repeated apologies, he showed me two pictures and asked if I knew who the people were because he was trying to track them down. It was dark, so I switched the light on and quickly glanced and then said I didn't. I showed my friend, and she just shook her head without properly looking. She was still in shock. The man didn't ask for the photos back, nor did that conversation go any further. He apologized again and wished us a good night. Without realizing, I joked that we would be better back at the hotel. He laughed, and then he just walked off. 
didn't take the pictures. And so, well, we just drove off too. When we were in the hotel room, I looked at the two pictures more attentively this time, and when I did, I felt sick to the pit of my stomach. Because one of the pictures was of me and my friend stood at the water's edge overlooking the lock with my arm wrapped around her. The picture had actually been taken from behind us. The second picture was one of me and my friend walking together, our faces clearly seen, and that picture was taken from the side. But it must have been done in a, a wooded area too because you could see the branches sort of. We both sat for about an hour with the pictures in our fingertips, just sort of speechless. I tried to remember the man, but I couldn't remember any features because of the darkness besides a beard, I think, and glasses, and also that he was soft-spoken. And later that night, I was awoken by my friend who was screaming frantically. When I ran into the room, she said that a man with glasses was watching her through the window. And at that, we packed up and we left pretty quickly. I've never been back to the Loch Ness since then, and honestly, I don't intend to. So for context, I was raised in a firmly Christian home. My mother and father are deliverance ministers, which is the Christian equivalent of, like, an exorcist. They would basically take time out of their schedule to help people who called with spiritual issues and on occasion cast out demons if the case was really bad. Because of where we lived too, there was quite a few people who had a, a screw or two loose, mostly because of drugs and gangs and stuff. Often the worst cases of demonic possession would get like four hours of chatting, anointing, praying and casting out demons. Surprisingly too, almost everyone who came in for help got better and sometimes would even become good family friends. Amazingly though, many people who would have been deemed catatonic or schizophrenic would also make a full recovery and live stable lives. I know this is going to sound a bit weird too, but I'm a bit of a skeptic of this. A firm believer in Christ and the demonic, but this is some of my spooky childhood experiences that have stood out to me that I wanted to share with you guys. Like I said, I am a bit of a skeptic still, but anyway, this is what happened. So my childhood home, especially my room, was not a fun place to be after dark. It was a very odd room. Later in life too, I learned why it was actually designed the way it was. The house was actually meant to be built in the opposite direction and my bedroom was a mistake in the house's design. This led the room to feel just really weird. For instance, the vent system extruded from the ceiling, and a section of the wall in the corner which protruded out with seemingly no reason just stood there. But the weirdest part for me was the sketchy built-in dollhouse. It was a closet that fit under the vent system, and because the way the room was designed, there was no light in the dollhouse walk-in closet. And two experiences in particular in that room have always stayed with me. Both of them scared me really badly as a kid, and... I gave the reoccurring experiences, there were more than just these two nicknames as I got older and moved out of the house. But the first one, I titled Mr. Blanket. So my first paranormal experience has to do with my blanket forts. The nickname Blanket Fort comes from the apparition's appearance. It was always covered under thick cloth blankets. Mr. Blanket would often appear late into the night, somewhere around 11 or 12 p.m. after I'd gone to sleep. My worst encounter with Mr. Blanket, though, happened during the winter. Everything on the second story was always really cold, and we would often use lots of blankets up there. As a child, seeing all the blankets and the pillows lying about gave me a brilliant idea to build blanket forts in my room. My sister and I would play inside the forts, and we had lots of good memories in there. But on this particular night, we had a pillow fight and left the blankets and pillows strewn all over the floor of my room. I woke up to the sound of something rustling in my room. I looked out across my dimly lit room and that was when I saw it. The figure stood about three and a half feet tall and was covered entirely by a blanket. It stood at the corner of my room and at first I honestly thought that I was dreaming and closed my eyes again. A few seconds later I opened them and the figure had 
Now move closer to my bed. It was standing in the middle of my room, and in a panic, I sort of got up from my bed and ran to turn the light on. The room was flooded with light, and I turned back, and the figure that I saw was now gone. With only a blanket left on the floor where it stood, I sort of looked around, but there was nothing to find. I went to my parents, who were sleeping in the downstairs bedroom, and I asked if I could sleep with them that night, and told them about what I'd saw. They told me that it was just a dream, and I should go back upstairs and get back to bed. Turning the light off and going back to bed was, honestly, one of the hardest things to do as a kid. I remember thinking that it was waiting for me to sleep as that's when it would come out. When I finally was ready to sleep too, I decided to open my eyes one last time before passing out. And this is the moment that's always stuck with me. When I opened my eyes, it was only an arm length away from my bed, just standing there, still, like perfectly still, almost as if it was watching me. At that moment, I felt like death was at my bedside, and I felt like if I moved in the wrong way, I would instantly be dragged away by whatever the heck this thing was. It was close enough, too, that I would have been able to reach out and touch its head if I wanted to. My plan from that point, too, was to grab it before it did the same to me. I sheepishly raised my hand toward the figure. It stood as still as a statue before. I quickly grabbed the blanket and flung it up onto the bed to reveal... Nothing. There was nothing under the blanket. No furniture. No sibling trying to prank me. Absolutely nothing. After that point, Mr. Blanket, whoever he was, seemed to leave me alone. He did show up once or twice after that, but he never did get as close as he did that cold winter night. Personally, though, compared to the rest of my experiences, Mr. Blanket was definitely one of the worst. The second one, though, is called the Slammer. And to me, Slammer was the scariest one, mostly because it wasn't limited to the night like the other ones. In fact, you could actively watch as in clear daylight as it did its thing. If a door was left open or unlocked, he would mess with them during any time of the day. It got so bad that the doors to the upstairs bedrooms were actually removed at one point. Our parents thought that I and my sister would slam the doors just for fun or out of spite, but we both knew that the doors would fly open or slam shut by themselves. I remember the last night Slammer messed with those doors too. It was when my parents both came home late and I was left alone at home. I was playing with my toys, only to have my closet, which was closed and locked, that's how bad it got eventually, fly open and I was confused, watched as it closed, leaving a hole in the drywall where the handle was. And to say that I was on edge would be an understatement. But then, the real spooky stuff happened. All three of the upstairs doors opened and then slammed closed all at once. And right at that moment, my ten-year-old self decided that it was high time to do some demon hunting and I prayed for protection over every room and kept reading of verses from the Bible until my parents got back. And at first, they were really ticked off. They had actually just reinstalled the doors and even added locks for this exact reason, but after I told them what happened and showed them the proof, a kid my age can't slam a door so hard that it breaks a drywall like that. They anointed all of the doors and casted the demonic spirits out of the house. But what sticks with me is that after that night, I never had another demonic issue in my room ever again. I eventually moved too and all of the paranormal stuff went away. My parents also stopped having deliverance sessions in her house after that point too, which I don't know if it's all related, but it could be, I suppose. Like I said at the start, I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to a lot of this stuff, but I've definitely experienced enough to know that all of this, it's definitely real. When I was in 6th grade, I was in a band, clarinet. I wanted to play saxophone, but Grandpa had a clarinet, so that's what it ended up being. The band instructor was a middle-aged woman who I'm going to refer to as Mrs. Frond. 
I'm watching Bob's Burgers while writing this, so as to protect her identity. Anyways, I didn't have a lot of friends growing up, so I had a lot of extra lessons after school. After a while, she started offering me extra lessons at her house, and even then that made me uncomfortable and I just refused. She was pretty persistent though and would offer at least once a week, and eventually I just stopped going back altogether for extra lessons. And one day Miss Frond announced that we had been invited to be in the Christmas parade downtown. Awesome, that's great I thought. The school is literally a year old, it's great for exposure and best of all, it was going to be fun. We were really excited too, we all had extra rehearsals and the school made sure that we had whatever we needed. Permission slips were soon signed and everything went perfectly. The day of the parade we all meet at our designated area. As we get dropped off, Miss Frond tells the parents where to pick us up at the end, and her and some parade officials were the ones watching over us after they left. The parade starts and everything goes smoothly, at least from my perspective. I was so nervous though that there could have been a five float pile up and I wouldn't have noticed. But at the end, everyone gets picked up and I'm the last one left alone with Miss Frond. And Miss Frond immediately grabs my arm after the last kid is out of sight and tells me that I can call my mum from her house. And she starts booking it, me in tow. I had very little experience being on my own and I really didn't know how to act in this kind of situation. So despite the fact that I had recently been uncomfortable around her, I just sort of went along with it. Well, looking back... It probably didn't look that unusual to anyone because she wasn't tall and I really shot up in 6th grade so it's not like I was being dragged or anything. In fact, I kept up pretty well. I couldn't tell you too where in particular that she took me but it was definitely further out than where everyone else was parked. Her car is the only one in sight and she starts a beeline towards it. It was one of those dark blue green SUVs that pretty much everyone had in the late 90s. And suddenly, I hear my name being yelled behind me. I turn and I see my mum panting and sprinting towards us. Miss Fron's grip tightens and she speeds up. And eventually, mum yanked me from Miss Fron's grip and, without a word, took me to her car and we went home where she proceeded to fawn over me, which was confusing because I was pretty much ignored like 99% of the time. I guess I just had no idea what had happened. After that too, I never saw Miss Frond again in school or heard anything about her ever again. In fact, I don't even know her first name to look her up and my family, they never really spoke about her ever again. So I've held on to this story for like the last six years because, well, I know it sounds crazy and... I've just got told not to talk about it, so I just haven't. But now I want to share it with you guys to get it off my chest. So I went camping maybe six years ago with a now ex-boyfriend of mine. The campsite that we picked was beautiful too. We were able to drive in through some rough trails. The spot that we picked was next to some hiking trails that weren't very far from some natural hot springs and a huge waterfall too. We were in the middle of nowhere with absolutely nobody around us. We set up camp next to the car, went hiking, soaked in the hot springs, came back and we had some dinner. It was all just very normal. That is, until we woke up the next day. Now, I need to give some context as to how we slept that night so you can understand my confusion. Before we went to sleep, I put our food cooler in stereo that we brought in the car and locked it. I put the keys in the front pocket of my backpack and put the backpack next to my sleeping bag on the far side of the tent, away from the door of the tent. My boyfriend at the time slept nearest the door of the tent with a gun next to him and we woke up the next morning and I felt fine. I had slept really well that night and from inside the tent, everything seemed normal. But when we got out of the tent, our campsite was absolute chaos. The fire pit that we'd made was ruined, the cooler had been thrown and food was scattered all over the place, the stereo was smashed to pieces laying next to a tree, all of the doors of the car were open including the trunk, and we just sort of stood there for a minute in silence just taking everything in. 
the woods felt off now too. It was quiet and not the beautiful campsite that I saw yesterday. Everything about these woods felt wrong now. My ex accused me of not locking the car the night before and that an animal got into our stuff. I promised though that I had locked it and went into the tent to grab the keys from my backpack, but when I did, they weren't there. Actually, I found them later on the ground, right next to the car. We quickly threw everything in the trunk and we just left. And my boyfriend was quiet and wouldn't talk to me about what had just happened. He finally spoke up though when we were almost home and told me that he had had a dream the night before about something kneeling over him in the tent holding his gun and just staring at him. And when I tried to ask him more questions he got quiet again and said that he didn't want to talk about it and that I shouldn't talk about it anymore either. I've tried to forget about it too but I just can't do it. Something really wrong happened to us in the woods that night. I'm just not sure what it was. So one night I was in my bed with my boyfriend. It was about 1.30 in the morning and I get a text from a random number saying, is this my name? Sorry for messaging late and out of the blue like this, but I don't think my boyfriend's name is being honest with me and I need to talk to you. We exchange a few texts and basically they're accusing my boyfriend of cheating on the both of us. Obviously I was annoyed, but bear in mind it was like June of 2020, bang in the middle of coronavirus lockdown in the UK, and we'd spent every day together since March. He denied it all obviously and insisted that he didn't know who this person was. The same number starts texting me too, angry texts, calling him a lying rat and stuff like that, not looking good for the boyfriend that's for sure. But this is where it gets really weird, because you see, this person gives no specifics. They won't tell me their name, what my boyfriend has done, only that he was a liar and that I was an idiot for believing him. I'd ask, but they would just reply vague, angry texts. Their grammar and spelling was good, but they'd use slang words from like our local area and stuff, so they must have been from around here. We assumed that maybe it was some kids who found our numbers off of Facebook and were having a laugh, so we just tried to ignore it in the end. Then, nothing. Until my boyfriend gets a text the following afternoon asking him to meet them at a local social club for some company. Me and a friend got straight in the car and we went down there. Nobody was there and the club was closed because of COVID, but we couldn't help feel like we were being watched. It was really weird. A few days go by though when the same number starts texting me again. This time the text language is all weird like spelling mistakes and saying why you too instead of you too spelled the right way. That kind of thing. And it felt like it was a different person texting me to be honest. They seem a, a lot angrier with me now because I didn't believe them straight away. And then they text me you're so dull I see him leaving your house earlier LMAO. Cocky, I know, but I said something like, funny, that's where my house is then, and they reply with my street name, which blew my mind. They also knew things about us, like the fact that he was in the army, but I guess you can figure out from his social media photos that that's possible. I don't know, but it was weird. I called them loads, but it would just ring twice and cut off. Tried searching the number on WhatsApp and on a few social media sites, but there was nothing there too. Only on Instagram the number would come up with a location of a film company in the Netherlands. But when I would Google the number, its provider is Tizmi, and I've never heard of it, but it looks like it might just be a fake number. They've never asked for any money or anything like that either. But I don't know, the whole thing is just really sketchy and weird. I really just don't get why someone would go through so much effort just to wind someone up like this. The last text that I got too was, okay, you'll eventually see LMAO, which is really creepy and I'm wondering, do any of you guys have any advice? Not 
A lot of these posts are about men creeping at women, but this one, this one's a little different. So this one takes place in early 2010. I was 16 years old and played lacrosse. I liked girls, but I didn't know much about flirting or anything. And one day I was just heading home with my stuff and a woman walked up to me and asked if I played. I told her that I did and I was captain of my team, since I was so proud of that. And she said that it was interesting and asked me how old I was. I told her that I was 16 and she laughed and said that she was 38 years old. After this, she told me that I was cute and said that she would love to come to one of my games. This woman told me to take her number down several times, so I did, but I didn't plan on texting her or anything. The next day, I was talking to a teammate and I told him about the incident. He laughed and told me that I was a liar, but to prove it, I decided to text her and ask her her age again. She responded with, Baby, I'm 38. Hope I'm not too old for you. When's your next game? I didn't know what to say, so I just showed him and I didn't respond. She then double texted me and sent me a few nudes and I felt really put off by this, so I told her that I was going to go and practice and I didn't respond. Now, later that night, she texted me asking what I was doing and if I wanted to come over. I told her that I can't because I'm doing homework, plus like my age and everything, but she told me that she would help out and show me a few things to which I said no and had a bit of a mini panic attack, but I turned my phone off and I just went to bed. A few days later, I was getting ready for my next game when I see a familiar face in the stands. I look closer and it's her. High wheels, she says. My stomach dropped. I mustered the guts though to wave back and I tried to put it to the back of my mind, but I couldn't shake it. After the game, she came up to me and asked if I wanted to come over and I told her I normally shower after games and she said that I could use hers. I then told her me and some teammates were hanging out and tried to walk off, but this woman grabbed my arm and asked why I've been dodging her. She asked if I was man enough for her and said that I need to stop playing games. My coach heard and came over and asked if everything was good, to which I said no and tried to get her off of me, and my coach ended up having to restrain her while I backed away. As I'm walking away, I hear her say, whatever you say and a whole bunch of expletives, and I just felt so sick that I honestly almost vomited. After this, I had to have a meeting with my coach, my parents, and the principal of my school as well. They explained to me that this woman was wrong and should not have sent me those messages or come to my game like that. They reassured me that I did nothing wrong, which is why I didn't tell them about this sooner, and that this woman was... Nutty as a squirrel. I promised myself and my parents too that if I ever did see her again that I would press charges for stalking and for sending nudes to a minor, but I never did. Anyway, that's my story and like I said, it's not the norm, but I felt like I should share it. This is a really interesting and sort of perplexing story that is also very sad and unfortunate. So, my dad was born in Afghanistan and stayed there up until he was like 30, after which he left just before the country became radicalized. He lived in the countryside surrounded by the forest, eerie caves, and quiet mountains. In Afghanistan, the people are very wary of the jinn, and they don't go out after sunset because of horrifying things that have happened to people. Even during my dad's time in Afghanistan, the people were always careful never to let their kids play out in the woods alone unless they were in a really large group of people. But my dad had a brother who was three years younger than him, making him 11 years old at the time and his name was Dean. They would often dare each other to do silly things during the night without their parents knowing, which is pretty typical for kids, right? And this particular night, my dad and his brothers had stayed up late and they decided to dare Dean to run into the woods behind their home, stay there for about two minutes, and run back inside the home. I know this might seem simple enough, but keep in mind that they practically lived in the middle of nowhere, and the stories of the djinn terrified everyone. 
So my Uncle Dean left from the back door and entered the woods. They waited for about a minute when they suddenly heard a loud scream. My dad was in the army for four years and he's seen some pretty terrifying things, but he always says that the sound of his brother screaming will always haunt him for the rest of his life like nothing else. My dad and his brothers quickly rushed over to see Dean on the forest floor with his eyes wide open and sort of in a state of shock. They tried to get him to talk, but he couldn't for some reason. He just had tears falling out of his eyes and he was shaking. This carried on for three days and they called doctors and religious exorcists to treat him, but in the end they couldn't save him. He passed away soon after and for those three days he couldn't move, talk or eat. Nobody really knows what he saw too. Some think that it was a djinn, but the thing is is that I know my family members who have seen djinns or have been haunted by them and yes, they've been afraid, but nothing like this has ever happened to them. My dad's eyes though, they always water when he tells us this story because, well, he blames himself for what happened. Back in the 80s, my Aunt Kay was in her early 20s. This was before she married my uncle and when she would drive long distances back and forth between her parents and my uncles to visit. It was a bit of a transitional period for them. He had just graduated and she hadn't moved out yet to be with him. It was a long drive too across several states through the desert which took her hours to do. And this desolate highway would have stretches of road that lasted hundreds of miles where you quite often wouldn't see another driver, let alone a gas station. So, Aunt Kay set out and she began one of these journeys. A couple of hours into the drive, Aunt Kay noticed a dark vehicle slowly catching up to her. She barely noticed though as she continued to sing along to Les Mis until the vehicle got aggressively close. She turned off the music and looked into her rearview mirror, seeing the vehicle flash its brights and a hand pointing at her car and motioning to pull over. Alarmed, she quickly slowed down and began to look for a good place to pull off the road to see what was wrong with her car. The second that she began to pull off the road though, she said that she felt and heard a, as clear as day, don't pull over. Then again, stronger, don't pull over. Call it God, intuition, or just a gut feeling, whatever, but a jolt of adrenaline and fear shot through Aunt Kay's body as she hit the gas and peeled back out onto the highway. And heart pumping, Aunt Kay silently asked herself what the heck that was, as she saw the vehicle peel out behind her. The dark vehicle continued to closely follow, flashed their brights, and motioned her to pull over and stuff. And fear and confusion set in as Aunt Kay began to question what the heck was going on. Why was the driver motioning for her to pull over like this? Was there something wrong with her car? And what was that warning that she felt? It would have been a severe situation if her car broke down out there, that's for sure. Especially before cell phones, but she chose to press on. Just as her resolve wavered, she started questioning if she truly did feel what she felt. And in fact, she even started slowing down when the dark vehicle picked up speed. It entered into the oncoming traffic lane, in fact, and came level to my aunt's car. The driver smiled, pointed, motioned, and mouthed the words, pull over to my aunt. She said, though, that the second that she looked into this guy's eyes, she felt pure evil. She felt a horrible, sick feeling in the pit of her stomach, and again heard the words in her head, don't pull over. She described him looking scary, greasy, and noticed that he was missing a couple of teeth in his smile that she'll never forget. That obviously sent chills through her, and this quickly dispelled any thoughts that she had of pulling over, and she put the pedal to the metal to try to lose him quickly. And he chased after her. She slowed down, he slowed down. She sped up, he sped up. It got to the point that he began to try and push her car off the road in the end. Aunt Kay was to the point of tears as this creep continued to terrorize her alone out in the middle of nowhere. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Aunt Kay sees a couple of semis off in the distance. She felt if only she could get close or even get in between these trucks, she would be safe, so she took off. He continued to flash his lights, honk his horn, and tried to hit her car until she got close enough to the trucks, and 
As she got in between them, she saw the dark vehicle slow way down and eventually disappear from view. She stayed with the trucks for a couple of hours until she felt safe enough to pull over at a gas station and just cry. Fast forward several years now, my aunt and uncle are married, he's working at a law firm as a high profile criminal prosecutor in Las Vegas, she's now a full time mum of several young children and since I've known my aunt she's been obsessed with true crime, the Dateline, 2020 and Unsolved Mysteries were always playing in their house, but this day, this day was different. She was folding laundry in the kitchen while listening to the TV in the other room. The interviewer was talking about a man who was being interviewed on death row. As she paired another match of socks, she heard the man describe one of his tactics for procuring victims. According to him, he would wait along the side of the highway. A car would go by with a family and he would wait. Another car with a male driver would go by and he would wait again. But every so often, a car would go by with a pretty woman driving alone. So I would pull out behind them and follow them. I'd flash my brights, honk and motion for him to pull over. And Aunt Kay, upon hearing this, paralyzed, but continued to listen. But when they would eventually pull over, I'd tell them to pop the hood and I'd be able to tell them what was wrong with their car. They would and I would yank a couple of wires. And when the car wouldn't start, I would tell him no problems. My buddy has a shop in the next town. I can give you a ride and he'll give you a fair deal. Upon hearing this, my aunt slowly moved into the living room. They would get in and then I would rape and kill them, bury them anywhere in the desert. When asked how many times he did this, he responded, They'll never find all the bodies. I can't even count them. And how many got away? two or three. My aunt stood there, alone, staring into the same toothless grin that she saw on that highway that day. And it was Henry Lee Lucas. This happened to one of my friends. He and two of his buddies decided to go camping one weekend in the Uinta Mountains, UT. They wanted to go out in the middle of nowhere to really get away from civilization and just chill and fish and stuff like that. All three of them are pretty outdoorsy and experienced with camping and backpacking, so this was really no big deal for them. They went up the trailhead, hiked about half a mile up the trail, and then they turned off and just hiked for about four miles away from their original position. They had little trail markers so they wouldn't get lost coming back. They find a spot and there's no sign of anyone around. The ground looks pretty much untouched by humans. And there was also a brook close by so they decided that this was a good place to set up camp. All three of them had camping hammocks so they set those up in the trees and then just kind of explored around for a bit before they decided to build a fire and eat and all that stuff. Eventually the evening rolled around so they built a fire and made tinfoil dinners and were just sort of shooting the breeze. When they decided to go to bed, the guy who told me this said that he remembered laying in his sleeping bag in his hammock, thinking that even though there was the sound of water in the brook close by, and every now and then there would be insect noises or whatever, the woods were just really quiet that night. Like, being out of civilization made him realize just how rarely we as humans experience real silence since we all fill our days with so many noises and distractions. He said that it felt eerie in fact. He could feel himself starting to doze off when the worst thing in the world happened to him. He had to pee when already being comfy and warm. He figured that he would rip the band-aid off and just go and pee before he fell asleep for the night. He put on his headlamp, got out of his hammock and walked about 30 feet away from his buddies in their hammocks to pee. But when he was walking over, he thought that he saw something dart out of sight, unnaturally quick, and heard a sort of crack of a branch. But because they were so far out in the wilderness, near a brook, he didn't think too much of it. He unzipped, did his business, and then, right when he was zipping his pants back up, his headlamp shone on something on the ground that paralyzed him instantly. Because a few feet away from where he was peeing were unmistakably fresh human footprints on the ground. It had rained in the mountains the day before so the earth was soft in some areas and there was no doubt in his mind that these were not only human footprints but a 
whoever made the footprints was definitely barefoot. But the creepiest thing was that the footprints, they weren't staggered. They were side by side facing where these guys were camping. It was as though someone was just standing still at the edge of their camping spot in total darkness just watching them. Those were the only footprints my friend could see, no other prints leading to or away from the ones that he saw, but he was totally freaked out, obviously, and so he ran back to his hammock and got his knife that he always takes camping. He loudly whispers his two friends' names, but they were already asleep, so they didn't answer. He debated, too, whether he should wake them up, but in the end, he decided against it because, well, there was no real physical threat that he could think of that would justify waking them up. He put his headlamp on a brighter setting and he shone it up in the trees and around the general area of where he had peed, but there was nothing. He didn't sleep that night, obviously, and he just laid in his hammock wide awake with his knife in his hand all night. And upon reflection, those footprints, they looked as though someone had been standing there moments before he walked up to that spot to pee. And he really felt like he and his friends were not alone. When it reached early in the morning, when the sun was just barely starting to rise, my friend decided that he was going to pick up his stuff because he was still spooked and wanted to start hiking back to their car when his friends were up. But when he was taking down his hammock, he saw another set of fresh footprints, but this time they were like only 10 feet away from his hammock, like on the edge of the trees behind his hammock, as if someone had been standing about 10 feet away from his hammock, just staring at him again and no other footprints leading to these two footprints but he was full-on freaked out by this point so this time he woke up his friends and showed them the footprints and all of them got the heck out of there quickly and i guess that the moral of this story is that sometimes you're probably not alone as you may think you are Back in my early 20s, I moved into my first apartment. I quickly got a roommate, and my naive self was so excited to finally be starting in on an adult life that I didn't think about it too much. Now, there were all sorts of sketchy things going on in that apartment building, from the friendly drug dealer across the hall, the frequently reported domestic violence situation going on upstairs, the fistfights in the parking lot, and various other things going on, but... The one that I will always remember was the creepy neighbor down the hall. How this particular building was set up too was all the apartments formed a sort of square around and above the parking garage that was on the lower level. In the center of the garage were the dumpsters so everyone could just throw their trash down from the balcony outside. It should also be noted too that everybody's kitchen windows faced out in the middle so they were right along the walkway. On more than one occasion too, creepy neighbor would lean out his kitchen window and watch my roommate and I as we were leaving. But we had to walk right past him to get to the stairs and he would ask where we were going, give us creepy compliments and sometimes come up with excuses to invite us into his apartment. Like saying that he ordered too much pizza or he had some furniture that he wanted to sell that we should come and look at. Sometimes he would just stare intensely too and make you want to run past him before he could open his door or drag you through the window or something. Anyway, he also spent a lot of time every day rummaging through the dumpsters. Now, I don't have anything against dumpster diving or anything like that. Sometimes you've got to do what you need to do to survive, right? But doing it in broad daylight in front of all of your neighbors whose trash is in said dumpster is just super creepy. Eventually, too, he was evicted, but he just refused to leave. He also left a barely legible, all-caps, handwritten note on his door saying that the landlords did not have permission to enter his apartment and hid whenever they came around. In fact, I remember seeing him dash to his door, grabbing one of many notices that they had left before dashing away again to wherever he spent his days. I still don't know how they finally got him, but I'm pretty sure that he continued to search throughout the dumpsters even after that. I got out of there as soon as my lease ended, but I hope that he got the help that he obviously needed. But man, I will never forget just how scary that guy was to live so closely to. So 
This occurred in a small town in Illinois. I was 16 at the time, I'm now 28, and I didn't have much adult supervision at this time. I had spent the night at a friend's house and around noon the next day decided to walk to my boyfriend at the time's house. He lived about four miles away on the other side of town. But my friend lived on the outskirts with about a half a mile of highway between her home and the official city limits. So I set out on my journey. I remember not being thrilled about the walk and lit a cigarette as I got out onto the highway being careful to walk on the edge in the dirt, putting about three to four feet of distance between myself and any passing vehicles. As I walked, I heard the distinctive sound of a car pulling up behind me though. I turned to see a newer, dark, red SUV rolling slowly until it stopped next to me. The passenger side window rolled down to reveal a friendly looking old man. He was all smiles. To give a little bit more context to, my brother and I were raised by our single, hard-working father, with one of the core values of respect and responsiveness to the elderly. As a result, my brother and I have a major soft spot for old people, like most would for children, say. So I didn't in any way perceive this guy as a threat. Hey there, are you Anne's granddaughter? He asked. Uh, yeah, sure am, I responded. This road's pretty dangerous, you know. You wouldn't want to ride, would you? He asked me, very casually. I thought about this for only a second before I agreed. I really did feel that I would be safe with this man, especially considering that he knew my grandma, who was sort of a pillar of the community where I live. As I climbed in, I realized that I still had a lit cigarette. Uh, is it alright if I smoke in the car? Sure, he quickly answered. Okay, that's pretty cool, right? I'm obviously not an adult. I look younger than I was. And this dude's letting me smoke in his car and giving me a free ride? All because he knows my grandma? Neat, I thought. He introduced himself quickly as Danny too, and as we entered the city limits, he asked where I was headed. I told him the direction to my boyfriend's house, by Walgreens on the east end of town, and asked him if it was too far to get to, and also assured him that he could drop me off any time but he was perfectly fine. But I felt good about our arrangement too, until he started talking to me about his brother. You wouldn't be smoking those things if you met my brother, you know, he suddenly said, sort of ominously. I glanced at the cigarettes and then to him to see his face suddenly stern. Uh, excuse me? I stuttered. He's dying of lung cancer. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I blurted and immediately tossed the cigarette out the window. It was almost gone anyway, but I figured that that would be the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. Yeah, well, he's in the hospital right now. He's probably very lonely, in fact. We should go and see him. He would want to meet you, for sure. Now, I started to panic. This place that he mentioned was like several hours away from where I lived, and... Was this man threatening to kidnap me? Uh, I don't want to go there today, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. Maybe tomorrow? Yeah, sure, we can go tomorrow. But you'll have to stay tonight at my house then. I don't live in this town. And at that, I felt my stomach drop. I had to get out of this car quickly. I knew that we were getting close and I was running out of time too, but I'm not sure why. I just started yammering on about how my dad taught my brother and I to fight. I then went into a story about me getting arrested for beating up my bully. He didn't reply during these stories, but I could tell that he was thinking. As Walgreens appeared on my right, I announced firmly that he could drop me off right here. He pulled me into the parking lot, and I flung that door open immediately, jumped out while the car was still moving, in fact. I took the opportunity to run down the neighborhood alley and through my boyfriend's back door. Once inside, I just broke down crying. His dad went back to look for the guy, but of course, he was gone by now. Admittedly, I went on with my day after that. I tried not to let it bother me too much. That is, until I talked to my grandmother a couple of weeks later about the occurrence. She didn't recognize the description of the man. Nor did she know anyone named Danny. She was, however, concerned with how he knew her. 
Uh, at this point, I must mention that my grandmother was chief of bailiffs at our county courthouse for like over 30 years, which meant that if he wasn't her friend, then there's really only one other option for how they cross paths. I think I was pretty lucky that day, and the fate was on my side. This happened when I was born up until the point when I was nine and moved out in the early 2000s. So when I was a kid, I just lived in a pretty normal suburban British home built in the 30s. Like most interwar houses too in large British cities, it was that repetitive design which spanned an entire street, but there was just something strange about this one in particular. It just had things which to this day I haven't seen since. One encounter I kept on seeing was at night between 8pm up to before 6 or 7am when I woke up for school. I saw what I can only describe as a, a smoke or steam floating around the room every so often. This never really stopped too, it just happened for the whole nine years that I was there. And at night I saw this odd dark black shape which was even darker than the darkness of the room itself and carried this odd white thing in its hand. I think it was a knife but... I'm not too sure and it wasn't sleep paralysis as I thought it was because I can remember after I saw it running to my mum and crying out and sleeping with them. And you may be thinking, have you seen this outside of your room? Well yeah, my sister took a photo of me with my phone and forgot what it was but I'm sure it was an early iPhone I think. And there was this massive black figure behind me, maybe like 6 or 7 feet. We deleted that photo right away as my parents were very superstitious and saw taking a photo of a ghost as bad luck, as if having a ghost wasn't bad luck in the first place. But also, another minor incident that happened was after closing the door to the downstairs bathroom, I heard a loud manly scream and, I mean loud, the whole house heard it too and, though I did, I was like five so... It couldn't have been me because it was a really deep one and it wasn't my dad too because he worked long haul trucking in Europe and only came back on weekends so it was only me, my mum and my sister and the source of the screen just remained unknown. Of course you had the normal slamming doors and the lights turning off for no reason and even TVs just turning on. In fact I still have that TV but it doesn't do it anymore. Another really unexplained thing too was just the straight up bad luck of the house as my parents were in constant financial problems until we actually moved out. We still don't know what caused it but we might know who caused it as my dad said that one time he was doing some research and found out that there was a lady who died there in the 1920s. I was never told further than that and we did try to get it out of the local priest but to no avail. The priest actually knew us really well because of all this too. Did we try to debunk it? No, mainly though because there was just too much evidence that it was true. Sadly, there isn't any photographic or audio evidence of it, but we definitely saw things. And so we just never really tried. But I still would like to hear some of your theories if you guys would like to share. And thanks for listening. This happened about 8 years ago. I was 16 and had two friends living with me so they could go to college. They were from out of town and loved the beach. I lived on the coast. The beach is a lot like a home for my mum and she used to walk on the beach and collect shells almost every day. And one day we went and my mum went to a bar that was close to where we had parked so she could have a beer. About 30 minutes goes by and my mum still hasn't come back to the car so we went to check on her to make sure that she was okay. And she was acting very weird and saying things that just didn't make sense. There was a guy with her who was obviously in a biker gang, huge dude by the way, tatted everywhere, leather vest, probably like 6'5", 250 pounds. I would assume the guy thought that she was alone at the bar from the look on his face when my friends and I went to check on my mum. And I told my mum that it was time to go but she didn't want to leave this guy. She kept saying that she wasn't leaving unless he came with us. We got staff at the bar to tell her that it's time to go and that she's too drunk to drive. I didn't have a license too at the time so one of my friends had to drive. But this is where it gets really weird. 
So we're on our way home and my mum keeps looking at her hands and asking us why they're moving. She was moving her fingertips around so we were just telling her that she was drunk and that they're moving because she's moving them. To be honest we just didn't really think much of it. She also kept telling us though that she only had two beers. We get home and my mum gets out of the car and sits down in the driveway. There was a child riding a tricycle across the street from us and my mum said, Hey little kid, you're not old enough to have a license, you shouldn't be driving. But we thought that it was funny at the time because, well, we thought that she had just overdone it on the alcohol. We get her inside and put her in her bed and tell her to just go to sleep. We went back to my room to play some video games and chill. And about 30 minutes goes by and we hear something break and my mum started screaming. It wasn't like a normal scream too, it was terrifying, and just writing this gives me chills thinking about how it sounded in fact. We ran to her room and she had broken off a, a glass of water that we poured for her by her bed. When we got into her room she stopped screaming and stared blankly at the wall just mumbling stuff that didn't make any sense. She would uh, glance at us but you could tell that her mind wasn't there. There was a blankness in her eyes and her pupils were absolutely huge. I hadn't messed with drugs at all at this point and neither had my friends so at the time we didn't know anything. We get her to lay back down though and try to go to sleep but before we left the room she was just staring at the ceiling moving her jaw around. We went back to my room and talked about what we were going to do. We started to get scared because we knew that something wasn't right. And about 10 minutes goes by and we hear the car start. My friend stayed with her at the car trying to convince her to unlock the door and give them the key. I ran down to a neighbor and asked them to help because something was wrong with my mum. She ended up backing out of the driveway and got about halfway down the street and then just slammed the brakes on. We were going to break her car windows, jump in and turn the car off but she unlocked the car thankfully, stepped out of it and, and just walked home. We drove the car back to the driveway and I put the keys in my pocket. When we walked back inside, she was sitting on the edge of her bed again with a blank stare but was now kind of twitching. We went to my room again and were talking about how crazy this situation was. And about an hour goes by so we started thinking everything was calm and she was asleep until we heard breaking glass again. We went to the kitchen and she had quietly opened the dishwasher, taken frozen food out of the freezer and grabbed a pack of computer paper. She was also throwing plates at the wall and putting frozen food and computer paper into the dishwasher and when we asked her what she was doing, she just looked over at us with a blank stare and continued what she was doing without giving us an answer. After that we got her back into her room and I monitored her until I was sure that she went to sleep. I stayed in her room for a couple of hours and then I went to my room and I went to sleep. The next morning she called me and was freaking out instantly because she didn't remember anything and didn't even know how she got home. Apparently she had given the guy from the bar her number and he was calling her from random numbers all morning. We went to CVS and got a drug test to verify that she was actually drugged and yep she had roofies and PCP in her system. When we called the bar to get the security footage so we could try and find out who this guy was, they told us that their security system had been broken for a long time. When I was a teenager growing up in Southern California, it wasn't uncommon to hitchhike with my friends. This was way before Uber or Lyft and my friends and I actually always came out with cool stories from our experiences as nothing really bad ever happened to me yet. But we had some basic rules for hitchhiking. I won't go over them all but the number one rule was to never get into a van. The next biggest one was never get into a vehicle with more than two guys. Southern California at the time had a ton of 18 and under clubs too that also had 18 and over within and bartenders could always tell who was of drinking age by the band on their arm. It was not hard back then too to slip off your under 18 band and slip a drinking age one on but this was the 90s after all so it wasn't strict at all. 
My friends and I had decided that it was time to leave though, but I had told my grandparents, who were raising me, that I was spending the night at a friend's house. I wasn't ready to go and let my friends leave without me, so when I decided to leave, I admit that I had a little too much to drink and was probably visibly intoxicated at this point. We had pages back in those days too, and I had paged my friend, who I was staying with that night, that I was headed that way. I started to walk the three to four miles to the apartment complex when a vehicle pulled up. The guy was kind of cute, and my inhibitions were gone, so I ignored the safety rules. The first rule ignored was that it was a van. The second rule ignored was it was a van full of guys. But me being stupid me, I crawled in anyway. As soon as the van door closed, I knew that I had made a huge mistake. The cute guy summoned me to sit on his lap in the passenger seat, to which I obliged. He started groping me too, and the entire vibe changed immediately. I knew that I was in trouble. I played along though, and started talking about an after party with all of my hot friends, some that were models in fact, in hopes of putting their focus on something else. The driver summoned me to sit on his lap, which I obliged again. He would take his hands off the wheel, and when I would grab the steering wheel, he would grab me inappropriately. I felt that these four guys in the van were looking for an area to take me, and I knew what would happen if they found one. I then went into an elaborate story about how these parties usually went. I told of how Molly and alcohol were abundant, and how they were expecting me to bring the cute guys. I played these guys to the best of my ability because I knew that my well-being counted on it. And thankfully, they took the bait. The apartment complex had a few other complexes around it with a park in the center. I had these guys pull up at a park across from the park, approximately the size of a football field from where I was actually going. I played out how much fun we were all going to have. And as soon as the van door opened, I booked it and I ran as fast as I could across the park and I could hear the guys yelling and coming after me but I was too afraid to look back and I just kept running. I hit the complex next to where I was actually going and found a stairwell that had a few bikes chained to it and I slid under the staircase. I could hear the guys yelling for me and getting close. I was afraid that my breathing was loud and I was convinced that they might even hear my heart beating. It was so loud in my ears but I tucked into the fetal position and I closed my eyes tight. I guess subconsciously I just thought that if I couldn't see them then they couldn't see me. I'm stupid I know but I tried my hardest to control my breathing and my heartbeat too. I stayed under that staircase for what seemed like hours. And they never found me too but not for lack of trying that's for sure. I was too scared to move and I felt like they were waiting and watching so I was frozen. Eventually, I finally had the courage to move and carefully made my way to my friend's house where I was staying. I made it, and finally, I was safe. I never did hitch a ride from a stranger again after that. I knew just how lucky I was, and I know very well what could have happened, and I will forever be grateful that I did not become a statistic that night. Valuable lessons were learned that night, like number one... Never stay when your friends are ready to leave, and always stay in a group. 2. Do not allow yourself to get so altered that you throw away common sense, especially if you're alone. 3. Never go against your gut feelings, no matter how attractive or nice a person may appear to be. 4. Never accept a ride from strangers. 5. Never place yourself in a position of being outnumbered. And 6. Give thanks when you're able to see the blessings that you've been given. So I work as a front desk at a hotel and within the past six months we had a guest that unfortunately passed away in one of our rooms. Because of this pandemic my boss has blocked off the room even after deep cleaning just to be safe. Due to the hotel business not doing so well too, he also has a couple of rooms cut off from the power, which means that none of the electronics are working for those rooms, including phones, and this plays a big part in this story. Now, our hotel has two phones up at the front, one for external calls and the other specifically for internal lines, which are only connected to the phones in each guest room. 
I was having another quiet day during my shift alone, business isn't running as normal, and all of the housekeepers had left for the day, and the only staff left was the maintenance guy and I. I get an internal phone call from one of the rooms and answer it as I usually do, and it's just static noises, along with an occasional cut in between, like the noise you get when you unplug your headphones from a device. To be honest, I didn't think anything at first and thought it was a guest accidentally calling the front desk, so I wait a little more and then I just hang up. But then I realized that the call was from the same room that the guest passed away in, and there's no way that a call could be made from that room because the phone is unplugged. I was a little bit spooked by that, so... I asked the maintenance man who was just chilling in the back office to go and check out the room and make sure the power is still out. He comes back and sure enough, the phone is still unplugged and even took a picture of it. And he also has a log of what rooms have power and all the other mechanics and stuff. We even checked the lobby cameras to make sure if someone didn't go into the rooms and no, nothing. No housekeepers went in or out of the room at all within the past week in fact. Just as we were done checking the camera footage too, I received another phone call from that exact same room. And this time, it was just silent for a good 10 seconds or so. Then the same static noise, but this time way louder. I hung up the phone so fast that a guest asked if everything was okay, but obviously I didn't tell her. I sat there and tried to think of every scientific possible way that this could have been an internal mistake, such as outside sales calls accidentally getting caught within our internal calls, but that's just not possible. Especially if the phone cord was not plugged in. I mean, everything is impossible. I guess that I'll update you guys if anything else happens during my shift, but this whole thing, it has me spooked. To preface this story, I am a bit of a skeptic when it comes to the paranormal and stuff like this, but I am open-minded too. I always look for the rational explanation for odd things, like most people do, I suppose, but like I said, I, I am open-minded. My husband and I, though, we live on a farm of about 100 acres and we raise cattle. It's a family farm. My dad grew up here and my grandpa lived and worked this land until the day that he died. Which means that I'm familiar with every inch and have never felt scared walking the farm or the surrounding land. But a few months ago, one of our cattle disappeared. She had a calf, and if you're familiar with cattle, it's pretty strange for a cow to leave her calf. Depending on the cow, of course, but our farm is in the Appalachian foothills in Kentucky, so there's quite a few hollers. We just figured that the cow went down into a holler, died in the brush somewhere, or got out into a neighbor's field or something. My husband looked and looked, but never actually found her, never even found a body, never found any evidence of that cow, in fact. But the day that she went missing, there were some strange spots in the grass of the field where it was all laid down like something had smushed it, and oddly enough, two vehicles ran out of gas right near those weird spots. I thought it was just a... A weird spooky coincidence, like a haha very funny moment, oh the supernatural, until today that is. Because today my favorite cow went missing. My husband, sister and I spent approximately five hours searching for this cow too. We combed every inch of those fields, we searched the hollers, we checked the neighbor's fields, but there was no sign of her anywhere. She also had a calf too and was a notoriously good mum and the calf is still here. I figured that she got out into a neighboring cornfield or perhaps someone stole her, which would have been weird because she was an older cow and was the only missing cow. Until I experienced the strangest thing that makes me think that maybe this is all supernatural. You see... My sister and I were out looking for the missing cow around 6.30 or 7. And between two of our fields, there's a piece of land that we don't actually own that sort of juts between two of the fields that we do own. It's mostly wooded and bordered with a barbed wire fence. I knew our cows sometimes crossed over, so I wanted to search in there. My sister and I are both in our late 20s and grew up running wild in the woods. 
We hunted, climbed waterfalls, dodged snakes, pulled ticks off ourselves. Nothing scared us then, and pretty much nothing scares us now. So I crossed over this barbed wire to go look for this cow, and my sister stopped. Which is weird, because she's my younger sister and always follows me. I was teasing her, calling her a chicken, and telling her that I'd been here before, and that I wouldn't take her anywhere dangerous, and that she knows that. But she just kept stalling, and... I finally got short with her and yelled at her to come on. She crossed the barbed wire but kept stopping and finally she caught up to me but as I walked further into the woods I just got a really bad feeling all of a sudden. The only way that I can really describe it is dark and also my sister said that she couldn't hear me even though I was talking loudly and I was only like two feet away from her at the most. But I finally stopped, turned around and... We just booked it out of there. Once we crossed back over the barbed wire, that bad feeling just instantly left me. My sister went home a couple of hours later because she was unusually tired. I texted her and asked her if she thought that the woods felt off and she says that she was terrified the entire time. This is what she wrote in the text. It was like we were going down a dark path to nowhere. I like to explore but I didn't feel right. It gives me chills and almost makes me cry thinking about it, so I just told myself that I was psyching myself out. And it was right when we passed the fence, it felt like we were somewhere where we shouldn't have been. I was actually scared. I trust you and everything of course, but the feeling that I got standing looking into the woods was just telling me not to go, not to cross the fence. And the farther we went, the worse it got. Like a, a dark shadow or something screaming at me inside, telling me to go back. Afterwards, I also got a heavy feeling, making me so tired. This all happened this evening too, and we never did find that cow or any sign of her. I also have this horrible lingering feeling from being in those woods. I, I feel dread when I think about it. I'm exhausted and I'm jumpy too. I wanted to recount this story somewhere too so that I wouldn't forget the details and to see if anyone else has had any similar experiences or thoughts on what might be happening here, supernatural or otherwise. I can tell you though that I've never felt anything like that in my entire life and my sister is never scared, which I think is probably what scared me the most. I'm a 27 year old female and I graduated from high school about 10 years ago. In my freshman year of high school I was well known and had lots of friends. I was very friendly and every time that I saw somebody alone I would greet them and offer them my friendship. Sometime during the year in my maths class we had a new guy come in. Jose had recently moved to the US from Mexico. He knew hardly any English, but me being Hispanic, I was able to speak to him in Spanish and make him feel very welcomed. Jose, though, he had no friends and always just sat by himself, which was kind of sad. In that math class, though, I started helping out Jose a lot. He sat behind me and he would always play with my hair. Not actually head, but my hair, so I could hardly feel it. I sort of felt like he had a crush on me and... He wasn't bad looking, so I didn't look at it as a, a big deal. But for a few months, two or three months, he played with my hair though and it became a bit of a norm. He said that he actually really liked my hair and towards the end of those months he said that he wanted to play a game and asked me to write the things that I loved the most in life. He would do the same and we would both share papers. Of course I wrote down my family, God, friends and a whole bunch of other things. When I gave him back the list, he wanted specific names and he said that he would do the same. I ended up writing my friends' and family's names. Now one day we were just hanging out in class and Jose said, Can I show you something? But you can't tell anybody else or you're going to have to pay for it. I was really confused to be honest. I thought maybe that he wanted to ask me out or something. But Jose pulled out a Ziploc bag and I couldn't really tell what was in the bag. It wasn't until he placed it in the table and I noticed that it was a Ziploc bag full of hair. My hair, he said. Jose pulled up his sleeve and showed his arm. He had about 10 heels knife scars, lines made with the blade of the knife, that went right down his entire arm. 
there was a fresh knife wound too and he grabbed onto my hairs and placed it on the top of the freshly opened wound from the night before and said, you're mine now, I know who you love, what you love, if you don't do as I say, you'll pay for everything. These are all the scars and these are all the souls that I owe, anything and everything that happens from now on, think of me. And at that, my heart sank and I was totally creeped out. He started smirking, but I ran out of the class crying and ran to the office. Everyone was obviously really confused. I asked to speak to my counsellor immediately. I explained what had happened. Jose was pulled out of class, taken to the principal's office, and was expelled that day. I feared for my life, and they found all of these notes of other people in his backpack, and mine was there too. They saw the scars and they also found my hair, so that confirmed everything. After that, I never heard from Jose again. I've had some pretty messed up stuff happen in my life after that, I'll admit. But I always thought of Jose whenever it happened. I haven't talked about this in like 10 years. I'm afraid that if I mention this that he'll hear me and more bad news will follow. I know, kind of silly, but still, it's just how I feel. I got really close with God after this though, closer than ever, and until this day I don't know if Jose was just messing with me, but I'll tell you that after that encounter, I am no longer the super friendly and open hearted person that I used to be. So I'm staying with a friend for a little while and this was at her house. So my friend was asleep next to me and I was awake and crying a little bit. Enough for my throat to burn but not enough to wake my friend up. It was around 1.30 in the morning when the door to our room cracked open. I looked over and called out the name of her mum thinking that she was coming to check in on us that night. But instead I see the figure of a man crawl into the room on its hands and feet. It was like really low bear crawl too, keeping very close to the ground. Then the figure stands up and it was huge, a really tall man who was entirely black with absolutely no face. We made eye contact for a solid second, well at least I think it was eye contact because I couldn't see his eyes, before it just vanished right before me. I'm a pretty spiritual person I admit but I have never experienced anything like this before. And I got a really bad vibe from that spirit and turned on a light in the hallways once I got my bearings again. I did eventually manage to fall asleep and when I woke up the first thing I did was cleanse the house and put on a protection ward, banishing this spirit. I think this thing wanted to feed off of my negative energy and I've been having a tough time lately being in the midst of a very turbulent part of my life. Like I said too, I had been crying just before the spirit entered the room and... I cannot express just how many bad vibes I got from the whole experience. I do have some questions, obviously, like, why the heck did it crawl into the room like that? How did it manage to open the closed door? Where did it come from? I also wonder what this thing's real intentions were, and if it was coming for me or for my friend who was sleeping beside me. I'm really not sure it expected to be seen by me, seeing as how quickly it vanished when we made eye contact. But why did it crawl like that? Why? Of all the things you could do as a, a creepy spirit, why that one? This isn't the first ghost that I've seen. Like I said, I'm pretty spiritual and that's why I'm talking so frankly about it because, well, I believe in this stuff. But it's definitely been one of the closest and definitely the scariest encounters that I've ever had. So I grew up in a provincial town somewhere north of the Philippines. Back in the mid-90s, my mum had an instrumental job of helping establish schools in poorer provincial areas of the country. This was during the early days of cell phones too, and a lot of the areas didn't even have electricity, much less telephones, so getting contacts wasn't as simple as it is today. They needed people to actually travel from one town to another to bridge the gaps. My dad also had a farm about 30 minutes to an hour away, so they'd usually take the opportunity to check on it during one of the business trips. 
Now, the provincial roads that they had to traverse were dark and dimly lit with sharp turns, and stories of collisions and accidents taking place at the dead of night were definitely not uncommon. One of the most infamous sites in the region was a bridge in a town that I'm not going to specify that had allegedly collapsed and been rebuilt after a fully loaded bus was trying to pass a few decades before. There had been myths of witnessing bloody and bruised people looking into vehicles of passerbys, but I personally never saw anything in the many times that I've passed through that bridge, so I thought that it was all hogwash. But my mum told me this story once, and I've never forgot it. So, in one of their trips, my mum had two of her co-workers along. They'd finished their business trip and were on their way back home, and at about 1am they were still up chatting about random things, trying to keep my dad on the wheel awake. They were nearing the bridge when, from far away, they could see what looked to be a woman with frizzy hair and ripped and tattered rags that looked like it had once been beautiful, maybe a white dress, standing on the side of the bridge, looking off into the distance. My dad described her skirt as torn and flaring in the wind. One of my mum's co-workers said, Wait, is that a person? Wondering what a woman would be doing there in the middle of the night like that. This person... They might have intended to jump and this must have been a cry for help or something is what they assumed. But as they got closer, my dad slowed the car down to see what was up with this woman and when they were next to her, she suddenly turned around, looked right at them and gave them a smile. Her teeth were white, but my dad said that from the tip of her nose, the upper part of her face, there was just nothing there. I asked my dad to clarify, a little bit confused by this, suggesting that maybe her hair was obscuring the top part of her face so they couldn't see her eyes, but he and my mum swear that they know what they saw. There was just a black, empty void where the rest of that woman's face should have been. Everyone in the car was freaking out at this point, obviously, and my dad just hit it and didn't stop until they got to the next town. After everyone had calmed down a bit, my mum's co-workers suggested that they started praying, so they did. They prayed that they would be safe that night and not encounter anything else. Thankfully too, they all got home safely that night, but since that day my mum's co-workers have been pretty reluctant to tag along in these road trips. Even today, whenever I ask my dad to tell me the story again, he's still visibly shaken, getting goosebumps sometimes. Over the years, I've heard a couple of road trip stories from friends and if you ever talk to anyone who's been in these trips, chances are that they have a story to tell. I have a few more of these, including one that I've personally taken place in other towns, but I'll leave this for some other time because, well, I gotta get back to it. My mother once told me that flies were Satan's messengers but I didn't quite understand what she meant until, well, I was faced with an event that showed me just how true that statement actually was. So, when my son was very young, his father Mike and I worked for a real estate company as head maintenance and painting in the desert of Palmdale, California. We were having problems with some tenants at our apartment stealing tools and equipment from our garage, so the owner of the company that we worked for, he told us that there was a small house at the edge of town that needed some work in cleaning up. He said the prior tenants up and left after two years without saying a word, leaving everything behind inside this house, the garage, and in the back of the property. And all we had to do was throw away some trash, some minor repairs, and some painting. By the time that we were done, he said that there was a unit becoming available behind Mike's parents' place and we can have that instead if we wanted. And we were excited to get the heck out of this hole that we were in and even though we would be working during our stay there, it had a place for our dogs to run which we were grateful for. It all happened pretty quick too. No sooner did our things go into storage, our boss was calling us to go out there. The house was old and sat back from the road. There was one lonely street light shining in the front and a large construction dumpster placed on the side of the property. And it took us a while to make the place habitable at best. I told Mike, Wow, the former tenants really did leave everything behind from food on the stove to clothes in the closets. They must have been in some hurry, huh? But at least they left some nice furniture, I suppose. And the first couple of weeks were different. 
You know, all the creaks of uh, an old house kind of different. But the longer that we stayed, the clearer it was why the tenants left as abruptly as they did. Now, my son Cody's room was right across from ours, and sometimes in the middle of the night, he would just start groaning. I would go in there, only to find his legs over the foot of his bed, him still asleep, and the blankets on the floor. I just figured that he must have wiggled down, so I would tuck him back into bed, and that would be that. One morning, he was sitting in the kitchen eating a bowl of cereal while I was fixing the drawer, and he started telling me about this little boy in his room. I thought that he was talking about a dream, but he looked dead in my face and insisted that it was real. You see, my son had a very active imagination growing up, and he talked to everything, even his shoes, so this wasn't totally unusual to me, and I didn't think too much about it. But there were a few things going on that I couldn't explain. Strange things, but not scary at the time. Like... I woke up with a small red circle the size of a nickel on the upper part of my arms that later turned into a bruise, and Mike had scratches down his back that he didn't even know where they were until I pointed them out. And I think because we were so focused on getting this house and the property done, we just weren't really paying attention to anything that might be paranormal. Plus, Mike didn't believe in all that sort of stuff anyway. But later that week, I was up early painting the French door, separating the living room from the hall to the bedrooms, when my son came out of his room crying. I rushed over and picked him up and brought him over to the couch to calm him down and find out what was wrong. I thought maybe that he must have just had a bad dream, but his cry was different. But between skips of each breath, he told me that the boy in his room got big and turned into a huge monster. He was grabbing his foot, so I looked down, and what I saw was just humanly impossible. The end of his sock was twisted so hard that it was stiff and hard to pull off his foot. His big toe was purple, and there was a small cut where the other toenail had dug into it. In fact, it was so extreme that I was surprised that it wasn't actually broken. And... Oh my goodness, this was terrifying. And there was just no way, no matter what Mike said, was I going to let him sleep in that room ever again. All doubt was gone at this point. But there was definitely something in that house, and I had to stay on my guard. I called my mother soon, and I told her what had happened, because she knew a lot more about this stuff than I did. And she told me to go out and get some sage and salt and cleanse the house as soon as possible. So, uh, that's exactly what I did. Later that day, despite Mike making fun of me, I cleansed every room and we got ready for bed. Mike on one side, me on the other, and Cody in the middle now. Now, I would say maybe about 20 minutes after I fell asleep, it felt like a slap on my cheek with a voice that screamed, wake up in my ear, woke me up. I sat straight up too, and then I hit Mike and told him to get up, and... He grumbled a minute, opened his eyes wide, and I swear to you that the whole house was just vibrating. At first we thought that it was actually an earthquake, but it didn't stop. It was a pulsating vibration. Even the chain on the ceiling fan was moving. The logical thought was maybe it was the pipes under the house, but the pipes were located at the other end of the house, and the house was on a cement slab, and the water heater was outside. And just then, Mike jumped up, grabbing the bat next to the bed, and ran out the room, scaring the crap out of me. He said that he saw the reflection of a deformed face in the glass of the French doors in the living room, so he thought that it was an intruder. And eventually, he came back confused and sat on the end of the bed. That night, we laid there, feeling the house shake and moan until eventually we just all fell asleep. The next morning, Mike was talking with a friend on the phone, and the first thing out of his friend's mouth was, maybe the house is haunted. He gave me a look like, perhaps there might be something to this paranormal thing, but I sort of dismissed it. A week passed, and needless to say, that we were on edge, but the house was almost done, only the garage and the property were left to do now. It was a Sunday, and my mother, who had my other five kids for the summer, thought that she would make the trip over to the hill to see us on their way back from church one day. 
She said that the closer that they got, the more she had the feeling of just dread overtake her. When they arrived, the kids fluttered from the van, gave kisses and hugs, and then ran out the back to play with the dogs. My mother and elder sister came in and sat down in the living room. Everything was fine, but this look came over my mother's face. She said, Do you smell something? It smells like something dead. I didn't at the time, but the smell eventually took over the whole house and flies just started showing up in droves. And for the life of us, we couldn't figure out where they were coming from. Mike looked all around for a dead rodent or something, but there was no reason for it. We closed all the vents and the windows, but somehow they just kept coming and completely covering the ceiling and the hallway and down the walls like a, a thick fog. And then mum said that whatever was in this house didn't want them there. Because, you see, my mother was very spiritual and people often referred to her as a beacon of light. And I felt like maybe she was right about it, not wanting her there. But before she could get up and cut the visit short, her eyes got heavy and she felt really drained. She said that she didn't understand what was wrong with herself and because my sister couldn't drive, my mother went down to lay down in the van for a bit. In the meantime, the kids came in and after the initial shock of seeing the living room and the kitchen being taken over by flies, we made a bit of a game of it. We took the shop vac in a vacuum and sucked the flies right out of the air and off the ceiling and I remember filling up about two bags full and a half a canister with flies. And after making some fun of it, it started to get late and I knew that my mother wanted to get on the road before dark so I sent my sister out to the van to get her. Mum walked up the driveway slowly, stopping a few times along the way. But when she came in, she just said that she couldn't make that long drive feeling the way that she did, so I made some food and told her and my sister to sleep in my room and the rest of us hunkered down with sleeping bags in the living room, occasionally getting up in the night to kill flies. Nobody wanted to sleep in my son's room, that was for sure, and I wasn't about to let it happen either. But the next morning after a restless night for all of us, I asked my mother to take my youngest son with them. Not only for his safety, but so we could finish this job and just get out of here. And honestly, I thought that he was going to be upset leaving me, but he was really happy to get out of there. And to be honest, I didn't blame him one bit. But the most surprising thing was that 30 minutes after they pulled out of the driveway, every fly in the house went away. And not one behind. That was really strange. Anyway, my mum called after they got home and she said that and that didn't surprise her. The work around the house was coming to an end thanks to a few friends reluctantly coming over to help too, so all that was left was the outside of the garage now. On this day, my friend Bonnie and her boyfriend came over to help and she had heard so many stories that I think curiosity got the best of her, having studied the occult and... We were working in the garage and the guys were working outside. The garage was packed with dust covered boxes and just random junk all over the place. There was a thick layer of sort of desert sand too and dirt on the floor. It felt dark and ominous in there and despite it being in the middle of summer it was noticeably cool as well which we didn't mind at all but it was a bit strange. After we got all the boxes out we started pulling things off the shelves there must have been around 12 glass jars various sizes with brown liquid in them and something floating inside of them too that we couldn't figure out what it was. The lids were sealed with like red and black wax and what looked like hair was wrapped around the lid. I told her to just put them down in the end and finish cleaning so we could get the heck out of here. So she climbed on the bench and started emptying the cabinets while I swept the floor. And... It sort of looked like there was paint on the ground underneath all that dirt. And just then she said, ooh. I stopped sweeping and went over to where she was to see what she was referring to. She asked me to give her a flashlight and she started pulling out some pretty weird things. Like a crow's beak, a chicken claw, a bottle cap and what looked like brownish red dried ink and long feather riding quills and some human teeth as well. I told her to toss that stuff and just went on sweeping. And as I was looking down, it looked like the floor was moving, so I asked her to toss me the flashlight. When I lit up the floor, I noticed that it was maggots all over where I was standing, so 
I screamed and jumped on a stool. And well, my scream startled her, so she jerked and knocked over one of the jars and it went crashing down where I was sweeping and the liquid washed away some of the dirt revealing a pentagram painted on the floor and what looked like some sort of animal embryo, that's the best I can describe it as too, came out of the broken jar. The hair on my arm instantly raised and at this we both ran out of there as quickly as we could and refused to go back in there. We worked in the yard and left the garage and everything in it up to the guys. We never slept in that house after that day. But we stayed at Bonnie's mother's house and moved into our new place just a few weeks later. Which I was very, very grateful for. Also, just as a little side note, my son, who is 25 now, was actually sort of reading through this as I was writing it. And he said that he actually remembers those times, despite being so young. And years later, the kids, they all remember sucking the flies from the air and having heaps of fun, but they don't really remember why it all happened, which I guess is probably a good thing. So a bit of backstory first. As with most students, I was always broke and had a few ventures apart from my part-time job to bring me extra money. And one of them was house and pet sitting. I've always had a love for animals, so when this couple contacted me to ask to house sit for them for the last few days before they returned from their overseas trip, as the last sitter had bailed on them and their six-month-old golden retriever puppy would be alone, I practically jumped at the opportunity. And the fact that they promised to pay me the full two-week fee for staying there less than a week made it so much more appealing. Little did I know, though, just how bad it would all turn out in the end. I got the details, though, got the keys from the agent, and headed over to the house as it was already after 5pm and almost dark, as it was early spring. I got to the house, which was a really nice place, but it bordered a not-so-good area that was and still is prone to crime house break-ins, robberies, or stuff like that. It didn't bother me too much though because, you know, nothing bad will happen to me. I know, young and naive. But the first four nights they went without a hitch, just watching movies, jacuzzi, and just generally enjoying myself. The owners would have returned on the fifth day, fairly late at night, and I went over to check on the doggo. I got a call from them at about 10pm saying that their flight got delayed. They were going to stay in a hotel and do the three and a half hour drive back the following morning. And also asked if I could sleep there again that night. Which was fine with me. I mean, I was already there and had my overnight bag still in my car. So I called my dad to let him know of the plans. As I was still staying with my parents. And he specifically asked what the address was. Now, I normally didn't give details like that because, well, I was old enough to look after myself after all. But I still believe to this day that that is probably exactly what saved my life. Anyway, I eventually got to bed at about 1am and it felt like I would have only slept about 5 minutes, I think, when I was awoken to a window breaking and I could hear movement and what sounded like footsteps running down the hallway. The first thing I did was grab my phone and I just hit redial, thanks to my old Motorola phone. Redialing was as simple as pressing one button, as my dad was the last number that I had called, hoping that he would wake up from the call. I then dropped the phone in between the headboard and the mattress in case my dad picked up and he can hear what was going on. And I had barely done that when the first guy stormed through the bedroom door. I could see his silhouette and he had a knife in his hand. And when he saw me... He raised it, and he came straight at me. Now, one thing to those that are unfamiliar with South Africa and the crime is that robberies and house invasions usually are very brutal and violent here. People get murdered or even tortured if they in the slightest retaliate or don't cooperate with the robbers. Out of instinct, I raised my legs back when he came at me, and when he came within reach, I just kicked both legs out as hard as I could. Now... I'm not a small guy, I'm like 6'3", and at that stage I weighed about 100 kilos or 220 pounds, and I was fit and really strong. My time not spent at the uni or work was at the gym pretty much, and I could do an easy 250 pound bench, 350 pound squat, 
and when I kicked and made contact with this guy, he completely lifted off the ground and shot into the wall. Luckily too, the knife shot out of his hand as well. Before he got the chance to get back up, I was on top of him, driving my knee into his face and in return his head into the wall. I knew that my life depended on it at this point, so I put in some extra force. The guy dropped like a sack of potatoes, thankfully, but before I could get up, I heard the sound of a pistol cock and I immediately froze. It felt like all the blood drained from my body and I became just numb. I remember too, the only thing that went through my head was that if he shot me, that I would rather die than be disabled or dependent on other people that will have to take care of me. He stood like that too with the pistol against my head for what felt like hours, but was probably less than 10 seconds. I didn't move, I didn't even flinch, and he eventually said in very broken English to get on the bed, face down. I panicked, but thought that if he wanted to shoot me that he already would have, so I did as he said. He threw a blanket over me, and I turned into a fetal position with my back against the wall, just so that if he wanted to stab me that I had my legs and arms in front of me to protect my body. Now, by that time I had forgotten all about the fact that I had called my dad and the guy that I had need is still down. And then I heard a third guy come into the room and I could hear what sounded like Portuguese to me, I think. I couldn't understand what they said, obviously, but I sort of recognized it, as we used to go to Mozambique on holidays a lot and that's the main language spoken there. The guy tried to get this guy that I had put down off the ground, while the other started to ransack the house, shoving valuables into a big bag. It was about at this time, too, that I heard tires screeching and a car approaching at what sounded like Mac 1. The car skidded to a halt right in front of the gate and I heard someone scream. It was my dad. The three inside the house panicked and ran out the back door and tried to jump the fence. My dad opened fire, shooting in their general direction. Now, I know my dad missed them on purpose because if he wanted to actually hit them, he probably would have as he is not one of, if not the best shot that I've ever known. And I'm not saying that just because he's my dad. He is actually ex-Army Special Forces, represented South Africa in the Clay Pigeon World Championship a couple of years ago, has various regional pistol and rifle championship titles, and is a gunsmith by occupation. I've actually seen him hit golf balls at like 50 meters away with his pistol. But politics and the racial situation in the country at the moment would have had him in big trouble had he had actually hit one of them. I quickly grabbed the house keys though and I pressed the gate remote and my dad called the police while he came in and I met him at the front door and we walked out to the car to wait there for the police. It took them over an hour to get there too. There's some excuses of no vehicles available but by the time I had calmed down and started to look for the dog, I... Unfortunately, couldn't find her anywhere. I grabbed a flashlight from my dad and started scanning the surrounding yard, and as I got to the corner, I could see her there, laying on the ground. I got to her, and unfortunately, she was dead. Later autopsies, too, revealed that she was actually poisoned, and the police found pieces of meat laced with poison near the fence. Poisoning, believe it or not, is actually a pretty standard practice in my country for dealing with dogs at a house or that area that is targeted for a break-in or a robbery. And man, I was fuming and really sad too. The police were also pretty useless to be honest and had a I don't care sort of attitude and barely even took our statements. By that time it was starting to get light and I retrieved my bag, my phone and I locked the house as good as I could without touching anything and... I drove home behind my dad, and only when I got home did I get the story from my dad's side. He said that he answered my call, only to hear the shouting and what sounded like fighting going on, and when I didn't respond, he flew out of the house and raced over. Luckily too, he asked me for the address the previous night, and he knows the area well to know exactly which house it is. Now, like I mentioned, my dad got there pretty quickly, and... He said that he stayed on the line the whole time, only hanging up when he stopped at the gate. My parents' house is about 10 kilometers or maybe 6 miles from there, through a residential area, and it's normally about a 20-minute drive. But the call duration, though, was only 7 minutes and 13 seconds, so you can imagine just how quickly he was driving. 
I met the detective there later that day, gave my statement, and they took fingerprints, etc. And the owners got back about the same time. And the rest of the day was just a complete blur because I was coming down from the shock and the adrenaline, I think. Now, as surprising as it may be, this is not where the story actually ends. Because about seven or eight months later, I got a call from the detective, telling me that they actually caught the guys and I have to come up for a lineup to point them out. I specifically told her that I didn't actually see any of their faces as it was really dark and after the guy held the gun against my head, I was under the blanket and didn't see anything. But she assured me that they caught them on fingerprints and will show them to me beforehand. Which might not be the ethically correct way to do it, I think, but they wanted to have as much evidence as possible against them, I guess. But you'll understand why in a minute. So I got to the police station, and unlike you see in the movies, there's no one-way glass or separate room. They just bring the three guys into the room and make them stand against the wall. The one which I was later told was the leader, which was the one that I had need, looked at me with so much hate as I had never seen in my life, but... He had the eyes of someone that would slit your throat and not even blink an eye, to be honest. His name was Joseph, Dragon, Sambo. He pulled his hand up to his neck and made the slit my throat gesture. You know which one I mean. We left the room and the detective gave me a copy of his rap sheet. And amongst others, there were four counts of murder. I think eight or nine attempted murders too. Multiple assaults, aggravated assault, over a hundred housebreak-ins and robbery, and even some rape. I, obviously, was very shocked, and the detective told me that had I not have taken him out first and fast that night, I would have definitely not gotten away so lightly. Now, this is also not where the story ends, because three days later, I get another call from the detective saying that I should be careful as he had escaped from custody and they hadn't caught him yet. I wasn't worried too much, I suppose, as the robbery wasn't actually at my house and I had changed cars, so he probably couldn't find me. Also, I had got my firearm license and I was now carrying a pistol on me like 24-7. And I didn't hear anything after that for quite a long time. In fact, it was only about two years later, I think, when I saw the detective in the grocery shop. We started talking about the case and she told me that he was actually killed during a home invasion. But I guess that in the end this whole ordeal has made me just so much more vigilant, heightened my situational awareness too and made me a little more paranoid to double and triple check all doors and locks etc. That's for sure. Also, thanks to my heightened situational awareness, it's allowed me to remove myself from a few potential dangerous situations in the years after this incident too, which I'm actually thankful for. But it's also robbed me of my peace of mind, which that sort of sucks, I guess, but I have since immigrated to a safer country, but I still sometimes wake up at night if I hear a noise. It's annoying, but it is what it is. Anyway, if you got this far, then thanks for listening and stay safe out there, guys, because you just never know what might come your way. So a bit of backstory first. As with most students, I was always broke and had a few ventures apart from my part-time job to bring me extra money. And one of them was house and pet sitting. I've always had a love for animals, so when this couple contacted me to ask to house sit for them for the last few days before they returned from their overseas trip, as the last sitter had bailed on them and their six month old golden retriever puppy would be alone, I practically jumped at the opportunity. And the fact that they promised to pay me the full two week fee for staying there less than a week made it so much more appealing. Little did I know though just how bad it would all turn out in the end. I got the details though, got the keys from the agent and headed over to the house as it was already after 5pm and almost dark as it was early spring. I got to the house which was a really nice place but it bordered a not so good area that was and still is prone to crime. House break-ins, robberies, or stuff like that. It didn't bother me too much though because, you know, nothing bad will happen to me. I know, young and naive. But the first four nights, they went without a hitch. Just watching movies, jacuzzi, and 
just generally enjoying myself. The owners would have returned on the fifth day, fairly late at night, and I went over to check on the doggo. I got a call from them at about 10pm saying that their flight got delayed, they were going to stay in a hotel and do the three and a half hour drive back the following morning, and also asked if I could sleep there again that night, which was fine with me, I mean, I was already there and had my overnight bag still in my car. So I called my dad to let him know of the plans, as I was still staying with my parents, and he specifically asked what the address was. Now, I normally didn't give details like that because, well, I was old enough to look after myself after all. But I still believe to this day that that is probably exactly what saved my life. Anyway, I eventually got to bed at about 1am and it felt like I would have only slept about 5 minutes, I think, when... I was awoken to a window breaking and I could hear movement and what sounded like footsteps running down the hallway. The first thing I did was grab my phone and I just hit redial, thanks to my old Motorola phone. Redialing was as simple as pressing one button, as my dad was the last number that I had called, hoping that he would wake up from the call. I then dropped the phone in between the headboard and the mattress in case my dad picked up and he can hear what was going on. And I had barely done that when the first guy stormed through the bedroom door. I could see a silhouette and he had a knife in his hand. And when he saw me, he raised it and he came straight at me. Now, one thing to those that are unfamiliar with South Africa and the crime is that robberies and house invasions usually are very brutal and violent here. People get murdered or even tortured if they in the slightest retaliate or don't cooperate with the robbers. Out of instinct, I raised my legs back when he came at me, and when he came within reach, I just kicked both legs out as hard as I could. Now, I'm not a small guy. I'm like 6'3", and at that stage, I weighed about 100 kilos or 220 pounds, and I was fit and really strong. My time not spent at the uni or work was at the gym pretty much, and I could do an easy 250-pound bench, 350-pound squat. And when I kicked and made contact with this guy, he completely lifted off the ground and shot into the wall. Luckily too, the knife shot out of his hand as well. Before he got the chance to get back up, I was on top of him, driving my knee into his face and in return his head into the wall. I knew that my life depended on it at this point, so I put in some extra force. The guy dropped like a sack of potatoes thankfully, but before I could get up I heard the sound of a pistol cock and I immediately froze. It felt like all the blood drained from my body and I became just numb. I remember too, the only thing that went through my head was that if he shot me, that I would rather die than be disabled or dependent on other people that will have to take care of me. He stood like that too with the pistol against my head for what felt like hours, but was probably less than 10 seconds. I didn't move, I didn't even flinch, and... He eventually said in very broken English to get on the bed, face down. I panicked, but thought that if he wanted to shoot me that he already would have, so I did as he said. He threw a blanket over me and I turned into a fetal position with my back against the wall, just so that if he wanted to stab me that I had my legs and arms in front of me to protect my body. Now, by that time I had forgotten all about the fact that I had called my dad and the guy that I had need is still down. And then I heard a third guy come into the room and I could hear what sounded like Portuguese to me, I think. I couldn't understand what they said, obviously, but I sort of recognized it, as we used to go to Mozambique on holidays a lot and that's the main language spoken there. The guy tried to get this guy that I had put down off the ground, while the other started to ransack the house, shoving valuables into a big bag. It was about at this time, too, that... I heard tires screeching and a car approaching at what sounded like Mac 1. The car skidded to a halt right in front of the gate and I heard someone scream. It was my dad. The three inside the house panicked and ran out the back door and tried to jump the fence. My dad opened fire, shooting in their general direction. Now, I know my dad missed them on purpose because if he wanted to actually hit them, he probably would have as he is not one of, if not the best shot that I've ever known. And I'm not saying that just because he's my dad. He is actually ex-Army Special Forces, represented South Africa in the Clay Pigeon World Championship a couple of years ago, has various regional pistol and rifle championship titles, and is a gunsmith by occupation. 
I've actually seen him hit golf balls at like 50 meters away with his pistol. But politics and the racial situation in the country at the moment would have had him in big trouble had he had actually hit one of them. I quickly grabbed the house keys though and I pressed the gate remote and my dad called the police while he came in and I met him at the front door and we walked out to the car to wait there for the police. It took them over an hour to get there too. There some excuses of no vehicles available but by the time I had calmed down and started to look for the dog, I... Unfortunately, couldn't find her anywhere. I grabbed a flashlight from my dad and started scanning the surrounding yard, and as I got to the corner, I could see her there, laying on the ground. I got to her, and unfortunately, she was dead. Later autopsies, too, revealed that she was actually poisoned, and the police found pieces of meat laced with poison near the fence. Poisoning, believe it or not, is actually a pretty standard practice in my country for dealing with dogs at a house or that area that is targeted for a break-in or a robbery. And man, I was fuming and really sad too. The police were also pretty useless to be honest and had a I don't care sort of attitude and barely even took our statements. By that time it was starting to get light and I retrieved my bag, my phone and I locked the house as good as I could without touching anything and... I drove home behind my dad, and only when I got home did I get the story from my dad's side. He said that he answered my call, only to hear the shouting and what sounded like fighting going on, and when I didn't respond, he flew out of the house and raced over. Luckily too, he asked me for the address the previous night, and he knows the area well to know exactly which house it is. Now, like I mentioned, my dad got there pretty quickly, and... He said that he stayed on the line the whole time, only hanging up when he stopped at the gate. My parents' house is about 10 kilometers or maybe 6 miles from there, through a residential area, and it's normally about a 20 minute drive. The call duration though was only 7 minutes and 13 seconds, so you can imagine just how quickly he was driving. I met the detective there later that day, gave my statement, and they took fingerprints, etc. And the owners got back about the same time. And the rest of the day was just a complete blur because I was coming down from the shock and the adrenaline, I think. Now, as surprising as it may be, this is not where the story actually ends. Because about seven or eight months later, I got a call from the detective telling me that they actually caught the guys and I have to come up for a lineup to point them out. I specifically told her that I didn't actually see any of their faces as it was really dark and after the guy held the gun against my head I was under the blanket and didn't see anything but she assured me that they caught them on fingerprints and will show them to me beforehand which might not be the ethically correct way to do it I think but they wanted to have as much evidence as possible against them I guess but you'll understand why in a minute. So I got to the police station and unlike you see in the movies there's no one-way glass or separate room. They just bring the three guys into the room and make them stand against the wall. The one which I was later told was the leader, which was the one that I had need, looked at me with so much hate as I had never seen in my life, but he had the eyes of someone that would slit your throat and not even blink an eye, to be honest. His name was Joseph Dragon Sambo. He pulled his hand up to his neck and made the slit my throat gesture. You know which one I mean. We left the room and the detective gave me a copy of his rap sheet. And amongst others, there were four counts of murder. I think eight or nine attempted murders too. Multiple assaults, aggravated assault, over a hundred house break-ins and robbery. And even some rape. I obviously was very shocked. And the detective told me that had I not have taken him out first and fast that night... I would have definitely not gotten away so lightly. Now, this is also not where the story ends because three days later, I get another call from the detective saying that I should be careful as he had escaped from custody and they hadn't caught him yet. I wasn't worried too much, I suppose, as the robbery wasn't actually at my house and I had changed cars so he probably couldn't find me. Also, I had got my firearm license and I was now carrying a pistol on me like 24-7. And I didn't hear anything after that for quite a long time. In fact, it was only about two years later, I think, when I saw the detective in the grocery shop. We started talking about the case and she told me that 
he was actually killed during a home invasion. He apparently broke into the wrong house and the owner was waiting for him, pistol in hand. Shot him once in the stomach and once in the neck and thanks to the slow response of the emergency services and the police, he bled out on the guy's living room floor. And in my opinion, ridding society of a piece of human garbage. I know that that might sound harsh, but when you've been through something like I have, it's the only way that you feel. Anyway... Uh, I want to add a bit of info to this too, because all three that were caught were actually Mozambican nationals, undocumented and no fingerprints or ID in the system. Essentially, they were illegal immigrants. I know, it's a crazy political term right now, but it was true. And it is of opinion in South Africa that more than 70% of all violent crimes, they're actually done by illegal immigrants here, mainly Mozambicans, Zimbabweans and Nigerian descent. It makes it fairly easy because none of those countries have extradition to South Africa, so if it gets too hot, they just flee back over the border and nothing can be done to them. But I guess that in the end, this whole ordeal has made me just so much more vigilant, heightened my situational awareness too, and made me a little more paranoid to double and triple check all doors and locks, etc. That's for sure. Also, thanks to my heightened situational awareness, it's allowed me to remove myself from a few potential dangerous situations in the years after this incident too, which I'm actually thankful for. But it's also robbed me of my peace of mind, which that sort of sucks, I guess, but I have since immigrated to a safer country, but I still sometimes wake up at night if I hear a noise. It's annoying, but it is what it is. Anyway, if you got this far, then thanks for listening and stay safe out there, guys, because you just never know what might come your way. So I'm a 23-year-old female, and this story is about a 33-year-old man, his name was Greg, who I met at the gym a year back. So, I used to go to the gym with my mother, and being introvert, I very seldom used to engage with or even talk to people. Being in the gym since the last two years, I had seen Greg work out and never really caught him staring or even looking at me. He's a well-educated, well-spoken guy, and I assume that interacting with him won't pose any threat to me. But one day, Greg walks up to me at the gym and asks to add me on Facebook so he could promote some things regarding his business. I didn't think much of it as I'm barely active on the platform anyway and I let him add me. And slowly our interactions grew in the gym as well as on social media. I was going through a rough patch so I would often find myself looking for a friend or even more sometimes. And from the very beginning my mother did not like Greg because she felt that something was off about him. Nevertheless I chose to meet him and other mutual friends from ours from the gym for coffee. I wasn't strongly romantically inclined towards Greg, but wasn't overtly opposed to it either. At coffee, our conversations were quite general, but on text, Greg would occasionally flirt with me, but I would just ignore it, which in the end was actually a big mistake. You see, the more I spoke to Greg, the more I realized that I don't see any kind of future with him, even as a friend. Eventually, I started backing off and took longer and longer to reply to his texts. I didn't want to blatantly snub him because we went to the same gym and I wanted to avoid any hostility. That was another big mistake too, but Greg also slowly backed off and eventually we just stopped talking. Fast forward though about six months and I got my dream job and posted about it on Facebook. Greg congratulated me and told me that he was proud of me. And I gave him the benefit of the doubt and started replying to his texts. He again began making flirtatious remarks towards me, but this time I blatantly told him that this makes me uncomfortable and I don't want to be involved with him romantically or sexually. Subsequently, the conversation died down and we parted on cordial terms. He would text me messages asking for feedback for some of his work regarding music, but I would generally ignore them. Now, in July of this year, Greg messages me asking for feedback, but with another message asking whether I would like to withdraw from his broadcast list for feedbacks. I respectfully told him that I would like to withdraw since I don't see myself as being qualified enough for giving appropriate feedback anyway. 
He went off on the messages, most of which I didn't understand. I asked for context and he told me that I'm only getting that over call. I agreed to call. Another mistake. But we spoke for two hours wherein I made it very clear to him that I see him only as a friend and if he wants to pursue anything more, he's barking up the wrong tree. He complied and was very respectful throughout. I assumed that there was no harm in talking to him as a friend. For a couple of weeks, we spoke as friends too and perhaps as future work partners for a music venture. I was hesitant, I'll admit, and I would shoot his invitations to meet down by making excuses all the time. He was understanding though and told me to take my time. After about three weeks of being friends though, Greg comes clean about his intentions and lets me know that he is attracted to me. He began making sexual remarks towards me which made me very uncomfortable and I told him that now I don't feel comfortable to meet him since we're not on the same page at all. He was agitated by that but told me that if I wouldn't meet him that he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. And quite honestly, I thought to myself good riddance as I was getting increasingly tired of him calling me every day anyway and telling me about his inflated self-image. He told me that he'll contact me after a year and he would meet then if I reconsidered my feelings towards him, but I obliged since I was growing patient and I just wanted him out of my life at this point. I was off my phone that day for about six to seven hours and when I came online I was welcomed with numerous missed calls and messages, some of which were actually threatening in nature. He threatened to show up to my house and hurt me and my family. And this is when I realized that I may need to involve my family and the police. I told my parents the whole story and they didn't immediately contact the police because these could just be empty threats from a man who doesn't take no for an answer. But the following day, Greg bombarded my parents with threatening messages claiming that he was going to abduct me if they won't marry me to him. It was at this point too that we contacted the police. The police went to Greg's home to investigate, but seeing his behavior, he was on the roof half naked yelling obscenities. They declared him mentally unfit and told us that he can't be arrested. We withdrew the complaint and contacted higher law authorities and while we were awaiting a response, Greg allegedly committed a crime in a five-star hotel. He assaulted a female employee and a guest with a knife and tried to molest the employee. Consequently, an FIR was filed, which led to Greg being admitted into a mental institution. He stayed there for a few days, and now he walks free. We were able to file another complaint against him, which was taken more seriously this time, but we were advised not to create a case against him, as he's not as much committed a crime against me and would easily get off on bail in the end. And so, as much as it sucks... He still roams free and still continues to contact me from unknown numbers once in a while, making me feel like I'm under constant threat outside of my house. When I was little, around six to seven years old, I used to go with my family to a house in the woods in West Virginia. I really loved it from the view to the atmosphere too. It should also be noted that the closest house was like 20 minutes away, I think. But we went there very often, to which I considered myself a Boy Scout, because I love to go in little by little and knowing small shortcuts and others. I like to climb trees and see the sunsets and how the sun faded. Until one day when it was no more than five minutes to the house, when I was up in my favorite tree, and I hear some branches breaking, but very slowly not so far away too, I heard something big moving. I heard my mother call my name, which was very strange of her because at least she does it when she's angry, but I was excited at first since I wanted to show her how I climbed trees and which was my favorite. The emotion ran through me too until she called me again, but this time in a stronger tone. And I don't know what it was, but something inside of me took over and my instinct kicked in, I think. It was as if, in my subconscious, it made me say, come down and go home. And every time I heard it get louder and closer, it was as if the sound came from just everywhere. When I eventually lowered my little legs from the tree, I 
heard the most horrible scream that I will never forget as long as I live. It was a twisted and deep scream and it said my name again and this time I ran as quickly as I could to the house. While I was running to and moving some of the branches, I could have sworn that I heard breaking too as if something was following me until the sound just suddenly stopped and followed or something let out a very loud scream like that of a bear combined with a lion and when I got to the house eventually, my mother saw me with a frightened face and said, your pants, because unfortunately I had peed my pants. I said to her, did you call me, panting and gasping for breath, and she said no. From there I told her everything, and at first she didn't believe me so much, but when I grew up she told me that something very strange was happening out there. Since that time, I have never climbed a tree or entered that forest alone. And to this day, I still sometimes talk to my mum about this, about what that sound was and the fact that she was calling me and I could have sworn that it was her, but there was all the movements and the cracking of the branches and something big obviously moving in all of the underbrush, but I couldn't make out what the heck it was. All I know is that I think I was lucky to get away from something that was obviously trying to lure me in. So this happened close to 20 years ago. I was visiting my parents at their house for a week sometime in late spring, early summer. One morning, my mum woke me up and asked me to come out to the front yard to look at something. Her tone sort of tipped me off to the fact that she was unnerved by whatever it was that she found. She was standing at the end of our sidewalk when I joined her, where she pointed to something where the sidewalk abutted the driveway. Is that what I think it is? It was a trail of blood, or, or drying blood. I could see a few spatters of blood sort of trailing out into the unpaved driveway, but they were hard to discern against the reddish clay that is and the sand of the driveway. I soon lost the trail, although the general trajectory was toward the road in front of the house. At the other end of the trail led down where the sidewalk turned to run toward the gate between the house and the garage. Enough blood had been lost too for there to be large splotches visible on the borders of the sidewalk, as well as on the small patch of lawn between the sidewalk and the north side of the house too. The trail led to the holy edge that grows next to the house, and some of the branches on one of the bushes were bent and broken, the leaves smeared with blood as was the side of the house behind the holy bush, and uh, there was a sizable, maybe 10 inch, 12 inch across stain on the soil beneath it. The ivy on the fence next to the bush was also splattered, with some leaves entirely coated with blood. For context too, my parents' house is in a small town. The house and the garage are separate structures, with an ivy covered chain link fence running between the house and the garage to separate the front yard from the back. The lot faces the main north-south road through the town, while behind the lot is a street that runs north between their lot and the neighbor's house, then makes a sharp turn to the west, away from my parents' yard. Following that street leads you to another neighborhood on the right, while the left side of the street is bordered by a heavily wooded area that eventually connects with a large swath of mostly unpopulated forest and swamp. And from the amount of blood by the holy, we judge that someone had hidden there for at least a little while. Some of the ivy was pulled away from the fence between the house and the garage too, so it was clear that this person had climbed over the fence. From there, the trail became much more clear as it went across the concrete patio between the house and the garage. There's a window or AC unit sticking out from the window just past that fence, and on the other side of it, there was so much more blood drying in a pool on the patio, as well as more smears higher up on the wall of the house. Again, too... It looked like the person had hidden there behind the AC unit for a while, and, and by this point, we were certain that it was a person and not an animal, partly because of the sheer amount of blood, and partly because of the smears on the side of the house were way up higher, as if a person had leaned against the house with blood on their hands or upper body. But the trail then picked up again, but with smaller spatters, as if they had managed to control the bleeding somewhat. The track went across the patio and out into the backyard, where it was difficult to follow through the grass. 
but at the far back fence, some of the honeysuckle vines that grew over the fence had been pulled and the fence was bent, as if someone had climbed over it, and again, there were some smears of blood on the vines. From there, the trail ran out into the street behind my parents' house, where it became nearly impossible to follow. It was pretty clear that someone had been injured and was also trying to hide, which implied that someone else had caused the injury and was looking for them. And whatever the injury was, it must have been fairly serious because they lost a lot of blood in my parents' yard alone. But they had come down the driveway from the main road and they clearly knew that they could cut through the yard to reach the back street and the neighborhood of the forest beyond. But my dad asked the night security guard at the local school if he had heard anything on the police scanners that night about anything weird going on, but the guard hadn't heard anything. But my mum told me a few days later that the neighbour who lives on the street behind them told her that he'd actually had insomnia that night and had heard someone running down the street around 3 in the morning and also had seen a, a dark coloured truck make several slow passes up and down the street. I asked my parents if they wanted to call the police to report, well, whatever this is, but they were both in their late 60s at that time and I worried about them being alone while there were creepy things, presumably involving violence, that were clearly going on right outside of their house. My mum declined though, not only because there was nothing the police could actually do, but also because she worried the police might actually become involved somehow with what had happened. The local cops here have a bit of a reputation for being corrupt and she didn't want to have any sort of involvement with them. So I eventually just took a hose and a scrub brush and I did my best to wash away all traces of whatever it was that happened that previous night. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well for the remainder of that trip home, nor on subsequent visits. It kind of was like being in a house in a slasher film. Not the house where the actual violence takes place, but the one down the street where the hero or heroine of the movie runs and hides outside while being pursued by the killer, and the neighbor only finds out the next morning, off screen, that something bad was happening just outside while they slept. It was definitely a creepy feeling, and much closer than I ever want to be to that kind of situation again.